Okay, we're recording. Thank you. Good evening. It is May 15th, 2023. This is a public hearing on the finance and the FY24 budget. It is called as a special meeting of the town council and the finance committee. At this point, we have a quorum for the finance committee, but not for the town council. This is the first of three meetings tonight. All will use the same Zoom link. The governor recently signed an extension of the act that suspends certain provisions of the open meeting law. This allows us to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present in the meeting location while providing the public with adequate alternative access to the meeting. Therefore, this meeting is accessible in real time via Zoom, by phone, and as a live broadcast on Amherst Media, channel nine, is that the new channel? Thank you. Um, or live streamed uh, for um, and on amherstmedia.org. Uh, I'm going to skip calling the council to order since we don't have a quorum. And I'm going to ask Andy Steinberg to please call the finance committee meeting to order. There's seven counselors. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, given that we have a quorum of the council president, I'm calling the May 15th, 2023 budget hearing uh, to order at six at 531. I'm going to do roll call. Please let me know that you're here and you can hear us and we can hear you. Shalini Baumel. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Jo Haneke, not yet. Anika Lopes, not, yes, Anika present. Lopes. Okay. Um, Michelle Miller is going to be a little late. Dorothy Pam. I'm here. Thank you. Pam Rooney. Here. Kathy Shane is not here at this point. Andy Steinberg. Present. Uh, Jennifer Taub is walking in the room, present. Alicia Walker, can you hear us? Alicia, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you Thank all you. hear me? Thank. Yes, we can. Thank you. Awesome. Um, so um, we'll keep an eye out for others. Uh, Andy, please call the finance committee to order. And then I have a few more words. And then I'm going to ask Andy as chair of the finance committee to conduct the hearing. Okay, so I call the finance committee to order. And we do um, have, I believe, a quorum present. I note that there are four councilor members of the finance committee who are present and have already signified that they can participate fully. Uh, that's Anna Devlin Gauthier, Lynn Griesmer, myself, and um, Alicia Walker. We also have uh, resident members of the committee, and um, I'll ask um, Bernie Kubiak. Present. And uh, Bob Hagner. Present. And I don't think, oh, Matt yeah. Holloway. Matt's here. Matt's here. Yes, Matt. Present. So um, with that, we have um, seven of um, eight members of the committee who are present. Um, so I'll turn it back to Lynn for a moment, and then we'll get back to the hearing. Just to remind people, there's no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena and me know uh, to make a comment or ask a question, use the raised hand function. If we have def technical difficulties, we'll decide how to address those at the time and make a note at the in the minutes. So with that, Andy, please go ahead. Okay, so I'm gonna call the uh, hearing to order and make a brief introduction myself and uh, then asked Sean Mangano uh, to make a presentation about the budget. Um, Charter section 5.5a, which I'm not gonna actually read from, requires that the 
council refer the budget when it receives the budget from the town manager to the finance committee, which has 30 days from the date of referral to study the budget and then make a recommendation to the council regarding action. And then the council has until the end of June. The 30 days is up um, on June 1st. Uh, the committee has been in a series of meetings where it is uh, receiving testimony from staff and public comment and uh, considering each section of the budget in a sequence that's been uh, previously noticed. The section that I referred to also requires that during that period, the Finance Committee conduct a public hearing to receive public comment and input regarding the budget. And that's the purpose of this public hearing. Uh, and it is an important part of the Finance Committee process before it makes its recommendation. The Finance Committee will be completing its work on um, reviewing sections of the budget with two departments that will be um, meeting with us on May 23rd. And at the May 23rd meeting, we'll begin its discussion about what its recommendation is going to be and um, the issues that it may choose to present. So that um, is the context of today's hearing. Um, the budget for those of you who have not seen it and um, would like to see a copy is accessible on the town website. Um, when you go to the town website, just go under government and then in the section on the right where it says transparency, you'll see a tab for budget and you can click budget. So with that introduction, um, I thought it would be helpful to have a brief presentation about the budget. And I believe that our finance director, uh, Sean Mangano is going to make that presentation. So Sean. Thanks Andy, can you all see the PowerPoint on the screen? We can. Yes. Thank you. Um, so just building off of what uh, Andy said, I believe Tuesday night we have DPW, which will be coming to finance committee and that will focus on um, all the divisions within the, the operating budget, but will also include enterprise funds. Um, and then Friday, we get back to general government, which are sort of town council, town manager, all the sort of town hall um, departments, um, except for a few. So that's what's coming up this week. Uh, so this is a, a condensed version of the presentation that was already uh, given to the council on May 1st. Uh, so the topic is the FY24 budget. Again, thank you to all staff, partners, and community members that have supported the town um, through volunteer efforts and other ways. Um, everything we do cannot be possible without all of you. I won't go over Paul's quote again, but here it is if anybody wants to see it. So quick summary, uh, the FY24 proposed budget is $93,457,917. Uh, this is a 3.4% increase over the FY23 um, budget or the recap. And the reason we say that is because we did a supplemental budget in the fall. And so these numbers you see for FY23 include that supplemental budget that we added an extra half percent to operating budgets. Um, so it's 3.4% on the higher um, the higher operating budget that we had for 23. Uh, some highlights from this budget, it includes a 3% increase for operating budgets for the town, schools, and library. This is a little bit higher than our, our norm of 2.5%. Um, going into the year, we had prioritized operating budgets, and um, we believe going to 3% does that, and uh, anticipate that will continue in the future. Uh, it is the the number for the schools is eighty four thousand dollars lower than what the school committee voted. They voted um, a different number, but what's being proposed is the three percent increase um, that you saw on the prior slide. This one here, um, and we'll talk about in a few slides some of the uh, some of the ways um, we're proposing for working with the schools in the future. Uh, this proposal boosts capital spending up to ten and a half percent of the tax levy. That's the highest percentage I I believe we've ever hit. Um, in part because we have these projects coming up, in part because the cost of everything has gotten more expensive um, as well. 
uh, the proposal maintains discipline in meeting our long-term obligations, our pension obligation, uh, we've been doing a good job on for a while, and this continues to fund our OPEB liability, which is our other large uh, obligation that we have to set aside funding for, um, and this budget continues that. A few highlights, so an in infrastructure, a uh, $2.5 million uh, allocation for roads and sidewalks, including Chapter 90 funds, the largest allocation in the town's history. 40,000 added for tree planting based on feedback we received from the Tree and Grounds Division um, related to some trees that uh, will potentially need removal in the future and, and needing funds to replace them. And then $230,000 added for field maintenance equipment um, to better maintain our natural grass fields throughout town um, and at the high school and middle school. Uh, and climate action, 775,000 to purchase or lease two new electric school buses, including charging infrastructure and we anticipate $200,000 coming back from the Diesel Emissions Reduction Act grant that the town received. Uh, $225,000 to purchase three hybrid cruisers, $200,000 for energy efficiency and sustainability improvements, and really the, these funds are to implement uh, different components of the Climate Action Plan. Um, that's what they've been used for in the past. And $22,000 to begin establishing a operating budget for sustainability um, to cover things like the Valley Bike Assessment, memberships, and professional development. In community health and safety, uh, this proposal maintains funding for 10 crest, uh, 10 person crest uh, department, and it adds $20,000 to the crest department budget um, to, be, to continue um, developing their operating budget as their, as their operations come online. Um, this will cover overtime, uh, which has become a need, and uh, communication expenses related to their radios. Uh, 725,000 borrowing authorization to replace a fire department pumper truck. Uh, 450000 for a new fire department ambulance. Um, I'll note this one is not actually a, a funding request. This is, we believe this will come from an alternative funding source that's not related to tax revenue, um, but it is part of the plan because if we didn't have that other funding, it would have been a capital request this year. So we did include it in the plan. Uh, 8000 to establish a second lead dispatch position at the, um, uh, it's in the police department, but it's in the communication center. And 25000 for the public health department uh, which includes administrative support and uh, funding for the town's mosquito control district assessment, something the, the town voted a year or two ago, and we get an annual assessment that we needed to set aside funding for. In racial equity and social justice, the proposal maintains funding for a two-person diversity, equity, and inclusion department, and we've added $6,000 to support training and community engagement, again, continuing to uh, develop the operating budgets for the, a new department. And $5,000 to pilot a child care reimbursement program for elected officials. Um, again, something we offered during town meeting and, and there was a desire expressed that we should look at this again. And so these funds would allow us to start that up um, if approved. And then housing affordability, this is something that has previously been approved, uh, but it's notable that 1.8 million from community preservation was allocated for community housing. And within that allocation, there were two projects in particular that will produce dozens of new affordable units um, when those projects are complete. Moving to enterprise funds, uh, generally across all of our enterprise funds, we're seeing higher costs driven largely by wages and benefits um, and other inflation related items like utilities and fuel. And then in a couple of the enterprise funds, we're seeing infrastructure investments um, triggering higher capital costs or debt costs. Uh, there is a debt authorization in our sewer fund for $400,000 to help replace pump station number four, um, a piece of infrastructure in our, our, um, um, our sewer system, and $70,000 capital request in solid waste to replace the transfer station scale. And this is notable because we don't typically have lots of capital in our solid waste enterprise fund. Um, I think the last one we had was a roll-off truck that was partially grant funded. Um, and so there's not a lot of flexibility in that fund. So that this is partially funded through retained earnings um, that we'll talk about tomorrow night at Finance Committee. And then last slide, looking forward. So there's a couple items in particular. We're looking to secure annual non-tax funding, but they're for pretty important initiatives. Um, I already mentioned the ambulance. Another one is for the four firefighter EMTs that we hired that are currently being funded through the American Rescue Plan Act grant. Uh, one of our highest priorities getting these positions funded within the operating budget. Um, and we're working towards securing some additional annual resources that will allow us to do that. Um, and similarly, uh, looking to secure about $100,000 in annual non-tax funding 
to be dedicated to safe and housing, uh, safe and healthy housing and activities related to uh, promoting that. Uh, we will be coming back to you in the near future to review uh, a plan for allocating the remaining ARPA funds. And back to the schools, we've, we've proposed a working group to focus on the long-term financial sustainability of the schools. Um, this group would be composed mainly of staff, both on the town side and the school side, that will look at things like funding levels, cost-saving measures, um, use of facilities, to, to name a few items, uh, with a goal of having recommendations back to um, the, the decision makers by the end of the year. And then lastly, there's an economic development task force being uh, put together in partnership with our institutional partners. Uh, we've had a good run of economic growth in the past few years, and we need to make sure that that continues uh, to, to be able to do the things that the town has expressed that it wants to do. Um, and so this group will help look for, for new and creative ways to uh, promote economic development. And I will stop there and happy to take any questions. Thank you. I just need to make a note that Michelle Miller uh, can you hear us? I can, thank you. Okay, and Shalini, you were on and then had to jump off and now you're back on. So can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay. So I, with that, I think that we can proceed with the hearing. I guess I should note one other thing. There are two things that um, happen today that are in, um, in a sequence. The charter in a separate section requires that the council hold a public forum regarding uh, the capital improvement program, which was is where capital expenditures decisions are made upon recommendation of the um, town manager and that public forum immediately follows this public hearing. So while um, we um, as a finance committee consider both uh, the capital improvement program and the, um, the operating budget as a whole, this is the prime opportunity to provide input to the finance committee before it makes its recommendation to the council. And it is also the only time that you'll have an opportunity in this sort of forum to speak, though you can during public comment at meetings speak about the budget also. But uh, this is an opportunity in the public um, to, to speak as uh, on the operating budget. So with that, I think I'm gonna um, just turn directly to um, the public unless um, uh, Dorothy's, is, if you're asking a process question, um, please do so, but um, uh, we're gonna turn to the public, so. Well, I can, <clears throat> I can be very quick. Um, the putting money in for a babysitting fund is very, very important. But once again, we did not put in for an increase in the uh, salary or the honorarium really <clears throat> uh, for town council members. And I'm very concerned because in order to recruit a diverse and inclusive group of people, we have to change that. Right now, the public sees the unending hours of meetings that town council members have to be in. And um, it's never gonna be a good time to raise it. It was brought up in the first session, we were told too late. I believe now we have until July, but obviously that would be working towards the next budget year. Um, so, somehow this has to be done. Um, and we have to, you know, so I'd like to work with somebody to find out when we, how we do it and when we get it in. So at least it would be listened to because we have an election coming up. Obviously this, um, well, not obviously, um, it is possible that we could raise the salary in this session that would apply for the new people who are elected in the next election. I, I, is that correct? That there's still a chance that we could do that? Or if the budget has come and we've gone out, done to the, it seems like 500 hearings on the budget, are we told, no, you've got to wait next year? I mean, it's, this is a question I'm asking really on behalf of the public, really. Dor Dorothy, the yeah. uh, request, the motion that was made was referred to the finance committee. It is still in the finance committee. Okay. And the discussion at the finance committee has been 
delayed with the hopes that the teacher contracts and the other outstanding town <clears throat> contracts are settled, but okay. it will be discussed be in time for it to be effective. Um, should it pass and come back okay. to the council? It'll okay. be back to the council before July 1st. Okay. And the reason it's not in the budget is because, first of all, it only has to be a half a year's worth of salaries because mm -hmm. this council would not get the salary increase. Right. It would be effective in January, on January 2nd of 2024. Mm -hmm. In discussion oh. with the town manager, it's agreed that we would address that down the road. We would address that in the fall mm -hmm. uh, once the obligated free cash is there. And at that point, we may have to add money into the budget. Okay. Right. But the vote has to be taken before July. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Thank you, Lynn. I'm very pleased to see that this is, in fact, moving forward. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, Thad, let me turn to the public because this is a public hearing. And I want to offer the public an opportunity to comment, as I said, at the next session, you can also talk about the um, capital budget. So um, at this point, I'd appreciate it if all members of the public who would like to speak, there's, by the way, no one in the room um, from the public. So um, the public is people who are um, on the Zoom call. And the person who's um, calling from a telephone, uh, you can um, ask for recognition by raising your hand by using star nine um, on your telephone, and that will raise your hand. And uh, so um, if you're interested in um, speaking um, to the committee and the council um, regarding the budget, please raise your hand. And uh, I will ask that, um, Allegra uh, be brought in to the meeting. Would you like to do three minutes, Andy? Yes. We're going to ask that you try and limit the three minutes and to assist you, there is a clock on the screen. Um, so Allegra, um, please uh, introduce yourself and uh, uh, where you live and uh, Please um, offer the comments that you wish, testimony you wish to provide regarding the budget. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Allegra Clark. I'm a resident of District 2. I am calling in tonight um, for two reasons. One, I was hoping that the council could take some action around incorporating the Amherst School Committee budget that was recommended, which included an additional $84,000 that could save some positions in the elementary schools as they are facing significant cuts. My other request is that we fund press, not cops. I know that there has been some discussion as to you know whether or not we're going to broaden the scope of press services to overnight services. And while I know that the next step is that they're gonna take on 911 calls, it seems that based on the call volume that they've been working with just on their own, the first month of September, they had over 1700 encounters. So it does seem like this is a useful public service. Um, and again, my hope is that as we see how they continue to grow and shine, that we will be able to reallocate funding from the police department to the Crest Department. And we are requesting that that be done to the tune of 47% of the personnel budget of the Amherst Police Department. Um, again, fund Crest, not cops. Thank you. Hey, um, thank you, um, Allegra. And, uh, Appreciate your comments and um, yes, it's Zoe Crabtree be brought in. Hey everybody, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, so my name is Zoe Crabtree and I live in District 5. Uh, today, as I have for the last several years, I'm asking that you move money out of the Amherst Police Department budget so that our town can more fully invest in alternatives to policing. 
as you just heard a library talk about crest is now operational and has been welcomed to the town happily and, and to great success from everything i've heard even though they haven't yet started receiving 911 calls via dispatch uh, they've averaged more than 900 support interactions per month since launching in september um, that's more than 70 percent of the total calls that the apd handles each month according to the budget document um, and Crest has provided so much support despite not yet being operational 24 seven and only with 10 staff. Uh, in contrast, the APD has 48 staff, nearly 30 of whom are officers uh, moving around out on the street. Uh, however, uh, as I'm sure you're aware from looking at the budget, uh, despite offering nearly as much support each month as the APD, the proposed budget for Crest and FY24 is only 12% the size of the APD's budget um, and only 23% of what the CSWG originally recommended when devising CRESS. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the town is proposing to spend money on electric police cars. Uh, I'm in full support of the move to create an operating budget to operationalize the town's climate action plan, uh, but greenwashing the police is not the solution. The CSWG proposed a broad overarching plan for overhauling public safety in Amherst in light of racial justice concerns. I'm very happy to see that the town has begun to invest in one small part of that plan, CRESS, as well as the DEI office. The rest of the plan has been largely, largely ignored, uh, the, but the plan wasn't meant to be enacted in bits and pieces. The CSWG also recommended cutting the size of the APD in half over five years. Two years have passed since that recommendation was made, and there has been no reduction in, size or, or in the size or budget of the APD, and you haven't even frozen hiring. Uh, the CSWG also recommended investing in community building with a BIPOC cultural center and youth, youth empowerment center, a process of anti-racist visioning and healing, and a residence oversight board. I've heard that there are some plans for that in the works, but nothing particularly has materialized on that front yet. I urge the council and the town manager to embrace the CSWG's full slate of recommendations, which have also been endorsed by the CSSJC, and I, I ask that you please follow through on the promises that y'all made in 2020 to move Amherst towards anti-racist action um, and to cut the APD's budget in half. Thank you for your time. Okay, um, thank you, Zoe. Um, and I, are there other members of the public who wish to offer testimony um, at this point? It, please raise your hand and again, the person on the telephone can do so by uh, using star nine on the telephone. Uh, could you bring Lauren Mills into the meeting, please? Um, Lauren, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. So All right, good stay, stay, tell yep. us where you're from and then please make your. Yes, Lauren Mills, District 5 um, of Amherst. I would just quickly like to say that I, I would like to see in the capital budget um, money for planning and implementation for youth empowerment programs and centers through. ARPA funds and not necessarily uh, decreasing funding for APD, but using ARPA funds and um, town departments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any, uh, anyone else? Seeing uh, no other hands raised, I give it a moment longer. And if not, then I'll ask them if there's a member of the Finance Committee who wishes to make a motion to close the hearing. Before we do that, I want to note that Mandy Jo Haneke has joined us. Mandy Jo, can you hear us? Yes. Thank you. So still having seen no other hands, is there a member of the Finance Committee who wishes to make that motion? I move that we close the hearing. Is there a second? Second. So it's been the motion that's made and seconded to close the hearing. Uh, 
let me just go ahead and take a vote on the motion to close the hearing. Um, Anna? Aye. Lynn? Aye. Bob? Support. Um, Matt? Support. Bernie? Support. I think that Kathy is still absent from the meeting and now vote yes and Alicia. Yes. So the motion to close the hearing carries uh, with four voting members voting yes, um, one member absent from the council members and the three resident members are in support of closing the hearing. And I therefore am doing so and uh, turning the meeting back over to the council president. Athena, I just wanna make sure that I do not need a council vote to close the hearing. Correct, thank you. Um, Andy, please adjourn finance committee with a reminder that in fact, we're going right on to the next public forum on the capital improvement plan. And we will be using the same link and it is also joint with the finance committee. So you're calling the, you're adjourning both meetings and then convening right. them. Okay, I adjourn exactly. the finance committee. Okay, and the town council is adjourned. Um, so it is still May 15th, and this is now the public forum of the capital improvement pro on the capital improvement program. It is called as a special meeting of the town council and finance committee. It is the second of three meetings tonight all using the same Zoom link. We've already gone through the fact that we are allowed to meet this way based on the extension of the open meeting law. And we have added all of the counselors who are present at this point and made sure that they can hear and be heard. Um, and Andy, would you please call, oh no, I wanna say, given that we have a quorum of the council present, I am calling the May 15th, 2023 public forum on the capital improvement program to order at 6.02. Andy, would you please call the finance committee meeting to order? Yes, um, I will note that um, Sam Cor that a quorum of the council of the finance council finance committee is present uh, with four council members and three resident members. And we have previously confirmed that they can hear and be heard. Um, so therefore, um, I call the finance committee meeting uh, to order for the purpose of the forum on the capital plan. Okay. So this is um, a public forum per sec charter section 5.7D and per section Charter section 1.7, a public forum shall mean a meeting during which more than one half of the meeting time on the agenda is devoted to public comment. With that, I'm going to ask Sean to make a brief presentation, and then we will move on to audience comments. Okay, to begin? We can. Okay, uh, so just a couple slides. Uh, the FY24 capital improvement program, again, increases allocation of the tax levy up to 10.5% for capital. Uh, incorporates a plan for the four building projects and how to address them. There's funding set aside to address deferred maintenance of existing infrastructure. It includes a historic investment in roads and sidewalks. Um, and we continue to evaluate all projects through a lens of uh, their impact on climate change. And we're seeing a growing a uh, number of our projects uh, with direct impacts on climate change in a, in a positive way. Uh, the pie chart on your right just shows the uh, allocation of capital funds for this, for FY24 across different departments. Um, you can see by far the largest piece is the public works highway, again, because of the roads. Um, fire is a little bit bigger than normal because of the uh, financing of a pumper truck. Um, and you can see the other departments here. A few highlights from the capital plan, many of which you just heard, uh, two and a half million for roads and sidewalks, including chapter 90 funds, largest single year investment in the town's history. Uh, we added 40,000 for tree planting, removal and care, 230,000 for field maintenance equipment, 775,000 to purchase and lease two new electric school buses, including charging infrastructure, 200,000 of which we expect to come back in the form of a grant, 225,000 to purchase three hybrid cruisers, 
uh, 200,000 for energy efficiency and sustainability improvements to help implement components of the climate action plan, 725,000 borrowing authorization to replace the fire department pumper truck, um, and again, the 400, 450,000 or so for a new department, uh, fire department ambulance, uh, which we anticipate coming from non-tax sources, um, but would be uh, to replace an ambulance this, this coming cycle. And those are the highlights of the capital improvement program. And I'll stop there and take any questions that may come up. Yeah, I'm going to, I just wanna note that there are four people in the audience on Zoom. There is no one in the room. If you would like to make a comment, it's 6.05. If you would like to make a comment, please raise your hand. This is the public forum on the capital improvement plan. So if you would like to make a public comment, please raise your hand. There's one person who is on the phone to make a comment, you use star nine. You'd like to make a public comment, please raise your hand. While, we're wait while we are waiting, just let me again thank the Joint Capital Planning Committee for their work in making recommendations to the town manager regarding capital. Those are recommendations and uh, to the town manager and the town manager can choose to follow them or do variations on them. Um, that group meets, includes people from the school committee, people from the Jones Library, and people from the town council. And they meet usually once a week for the month of February and March. We're open for public comment. We will remain open for public comment until 610. Is there anyone who would like to make public comment? Please raise your hand. Last call for public comment. This is in regard to the capital improvement plan. OK, 
me. Before I ask Andy to adjourn, I want to thank the members of the Finance Committee, particularly our non-voting residents, uh, for being with us tonight and for all their hard work, particularly during budget season. Um, I also want to note that the Council's meeting is scheduled for 6.30. We cannot begin the meeting until then, since it's a posted meeting at that time. And so the council will go into recess until 6.30 and begin promptly again with our town council meeting, which is a regular town council meeting at that time. Andy, would you please go ahead and adjourn the finance committee? I adjourn the finance committee and uh, we will uh, have a meeting tomorrow in the late afternoon. Um, regarding the Department of Public Works and the Enterprise Fund. Uh, invite anybody who's interested to please join us. So thank you. Okay. And adjourn. We will continue on the same Zoom link, uh, but we will be reconvening at 6.30. The town council is adjourned. Please turn off your mics and your photo and turn them back on when you come back in. Thank you. The council is adjourned.
For counselors in, in the room and on Zoom, please start assembling back to your seats. Athena, would you please take the thing down so that I can see if people are back? As you return, please turn your video back on so I know that you're back. We'll, we won't begin the meeting until 6.30, but um, I wanted to make sure people had plenty of notice. Except we had a 20 minute break, but that's okay. As you return, please turn your video on so that I know that you are back. Michelle, Anika, and Alicia, can you let me know that you're back? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Alicia. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Are we going to start recording? We are still recording. We are still recording. Oh, my. Okay, good evening. Uh, it is still May 15th, and this is now the regular town council meeting. Uh, it's the third meeting of tonight, and it is on the same Zoom link. I mentioned earlier that we can meet like this because the open meeting law was um, extended and we make accommodations uh, for the public to attend because this meeting is accessible in real time by Zoom, by, by phone as a live broadcast on Amherst Media Channel 9 and by live streaming through Amherst Media. Given that we have a quorum in the council present, I'm calling the regular town council meeting to order at 6.31. Um, because we did have a break, I think it's best if we go ahead and check and make sure you're all here, you can hear us, and we can hear you. Uh, Shalini Balmil. Still present. Pat Angelis, Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Jo Haneke. Present. Anika Lopes. Present. 
Anika? She said present. It. Thank you. Just didn't hear you. Michelle Miller? Present. Dorothy Pam? Here. Pam Rooney? Here. Kathy Shane is absent. Andy Steinberg? Present. Uh, Jennifer Taub? Present. Alicia Walker? Here. Thank you. Again, there's no chat room. Please let us know if you have technical difficulties. Uh, we're going to put the announcements up on the screen. And I just want to um, note a couple of special meetings that are coming up. Uh, we will not meet as a council until June 5th, uh, but the Community Resources Committee is meeting with the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust on May 18th at 7, and then they have two other meetings. The various finance committee meetings are all listed here. NGOL will be meeting twice in TSO prior to our next meeting. I also want to mention a couple of community events. First of all, there is a Memorial Day parade and celebration that is on Monday, May 29th at 9.30, um, starting up right near here at near the North Common. Uh, the Pride Month flag raising is on June 2nd at 4 o'clock p.m. Race Amity Day is June 11th. There are events starting at Mill River at 10 o'clock a.m. through most of the day. And we will have a proclamation reading, but because of the event at Mill River, we're trying to determine the final time for that proclamation reading and the location. And then please mark your calendars for Juneteenth celebrations over the long weekend. I also want to note that the school committee will meet tomorrow night at 530 in the Amherst Regional High School Library. We're going to move directly to our hearings. Oh, we me. can't. They're, they're noticed for 640 and 645. Thank you. We're going to move to our consent agenda. Um, can you put the consent agenda on the screen, please? The following items were selected because they were considered to be routine and it was reasonable to expect they would pass without controversy. To remove an item from the consent agenda for discussion later in the meeting, ask that it be removed after I read the list for the first time. To re the a re request to remove an item does not require a second. So the motion is as follows, to move the following items and the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. 6A, waiver of town council rules of procedure, rule 8.6 for the Memorial Day proclamation. We did actually look at this in GOL, but we never voted, so we have to do the waiver. Uh, 6A is the adoption of the Memorial, Memorial Day Proclamation. 6B, adoption of the proclamation recognizing June as lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, plus LGBTQ Pride Month. 6C, adoption of Race Amity Day Proclamation 2023. 8D, approval of the surveillance use policy, police department, in cruiser, video and audio. 9A, one, approval of town manager appointments to the Amherst Housing Authority Board of Commissioners. 11A and B, approval of the following meeting minutes, May 1st, 2023, regular meet, meeting minutes. May 10th, 2023, special meeting minutes. Are there any items that anybody would like removed? Michelle? I'd like to remove 6B, adoption of the proclamation recognizing June as lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, Pride Month. Okay. We will take that up possibly momentarily. Um, since we're still trying to get to the point where we have our meeting, uh, are there any others at this time? Seeing none, that we'll do a roll call vote. We need a second, start. please. I'm sorry, a second. I need a second. Pat DeAngelis was a second. And we're going to a roll call vote. Just note that 6B, the adoption of the proclamation recognizing LGBTQ plus Pride Month has been removed from the consent agenda, will be taken up in just a moment. So I'll begin with Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers and I, Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. 
Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Bruni. Yes. Kathy Shane is absent. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmil. Yes. Thank you. Um, I am actually going to ask, um, as we do as our custom for the Memorial Day proclamation, um, Pam Rooney, would you please read the last paragraph? Certainly. Now, therefore, we, the Amherst Town Council, hereby proclaim May 29, 2023, to be Memorial Day and urge all residents of Amherst to recognize the sacrifice of past residents and observe this day in remembrance of them. Thank you. And I'm going to skip LGBTQ for a moment and go to Jennifer Taub and ask her to read the Race Amity Day proclamation, the last paragraphs, reminding us that we may be changing the date, I mean, the time and location. Thank you. Jennifer? Yes, thank you. Um, now, therefore, the town of Amherst hereby proclaims Sunday, June 11th, 2023, to be Race Amity Day, a celebration of the oneness of the human family and ask the community to join in a celebration at Town Hall Steps and on the Commons at 3 p.m. on June 11th, 2023. Thank you. Um, Michelle, you asked that the proclamation regarding LGBTQ plus be removed. Would you like to speak to your um, request? Sure. Um, first, I just want to apologize to the counselor sponsors on this. Um, I did not have an opportunity to reach out um, to let you know that I plan to remove it. Um, and the reason that I'm removing it is in light of recent reporting regarding the treatment of trans kids in our schools. Um, I was hoping that we could either, uh, you know, to avoid wordsmithing tonight, maybe send it back to GOL. Um, uh, and, and maybe it's a multi-part motion um, to approve it tonight with some additional language that would affirm our support um, for uh, our youth. Um, and so that's the reasoning um, that I'm removing it. And I'd point out that we do not have a council meeting between now and the time that this is to be read. So given that and that it is almost 640, we're going to return to that agenda item. In the meantime, perhaps you could craft the statement that you would like added and send it to the town clerk. Sure. And I, I mean, if, if that's clerk. not acceptable to the council sponsors, I um, have a suggestion for how we might um, approve it. Uh, going back to GOL, but approve it here, if that's possible in terms of our process. Um, but it sounds like we need to to move on and come back to it. It needs to be done as a motion. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I have I have uh, some idea uh, on motions for that. Okay, Pat, you have your hand up. Thank you. Uh, Please speak into the mic. One of the things that I want to say is that we have in. Um, uh, reached out to Saga, and I, I never remember what the initials are. Mandy can do that, which is um, a support group at the high school. We're reaching out to um, Sunrise Amherst and um, the other organization. I'm Generation sorry. Ratify. And so I'm, I'm really not sure. I want to hear what it is that you want to add, because we're even hoping some of the kids will be speaking. And these are kids who are both uh, gay, straight, trans, you know, um, and things like that. So I, I need to hear more. I'm pretty uncomfortable with this. Not the support of the kids in the high schools. That's why I want to hear what you have to say. Mandy Jo, you have your hand up. Yeah. Um, I was going to mention that there is no council meeting before the flag raising, which has already been mentioned. Um, I don't wanna take up much time while we have our representatives from Eversource here. So I think I'll hold my comments um, 
until we come back to this and have finished with the other source hearings. I'm going to pause this discussion and we will come back to it after we do the hearings, which have been scheduled for a time specific. Okay, so we are going to start with the first of two hearings, both involving Eversource. And I might mention that we now have seven people in our audience. If you would like to make public comment regarding this, please make sure you have signed in with Athena, who is the woman over here with her hand raised. When we get to public comment, I'll also be asking the audience who is on Zoom to raise their hands as well. So hearings are held so that the public has an opportunity to speak to is issues, in this case, regarding the public way. Um, we're going to start out with a brief presentation about the first of the two petitions by Eversource. Then we will make sure the counselors have any questions then we will open up for public comments and questions and go back to counselors. Based on that, the council can then decide to close the hearing or not. And um, if we are going to vote tonight, it would be later on in the agenda, although very soon after this. So with that in mind, um, the first hearing is regarding Eversource's petition to install new underground electric duck bank from South Pleasant Street to College Street. Um, please come forward, state your name, where you live, who you're representing. Thank you. Please take the consent agenda down. Thank you. Good evening, Madam President, and through you to the members of the council, my name is Mike, and the last name is Kane, K-A-N-E. I'm from 11 Lynn Ann Drive in Holyoke, also out of the Hadley Area Work Center at 55 Russell Street. I'm joined here with a group from Eversource, our project team that has been working on this project. Uh, we have Mike Michael Fraga, I'll have him introduce, and uh, our operations manager, Nick Kriegel, our senior supervisor of operations, uh, Dylan Swabby, uh, senior designer, and uh, Mitch Hubbard from our engineering department. And again, I wanna thank you for hosting this public hearing for us. It's a very important project that we have uh, going on here in Amherst. As you know, the electrification of Massachusetts requires a lot of work by, by the utilities. Uh, you've seen a lot of work here in Amherst where we've worked on our transmission lines, working on the substation, and now this is more towards our distribution. Uh, so again, thank you for hosting us. I have uh, Mike Fraga here to uh, talk a little bit more about the project. Good evening, Michael Fraga, F-R-A-G-A, uh, 1068 East Street, Ludlow, Massachusetts. Uh, I'm the operations manager in Hadley, uh, 55 Russell Street. Please speak into the mic. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, so I'm the operations manager here in Hadley for um, Eversource for this district. And I'm here to uh, go over the project. We are petitioning the town to install underground manhole and duct from our substation on College Street to South Pleasant Street so we can tie into the existing manhole system. This is gonna coincide with our substation project that's currently getting, getting uh, kicked off and uh, in the planning stages too, I believe. But what it's gonna allow us to do is to um, upgrade and the infrastructure through College Street. Uh, we've worked very closely with Guilford, finding locations that are suitable to the town for our project here. Um, we've also, with Guilford's help, we're able to add the scope of bearing the electrical distribution lines from Dickinson Street through the common, which I think is gonna be a, a benefit to the town. I think we have it up on the screen there, but from the railroad bridge right up to South Pleasant, South Pleasant now, the electrical distribution system will be underground, including all the customers fed off of there. So we've added that to the scope for Guilford's request. And uh, this is really a, a good project, I think, for, for the town, as well as, as, as us. It allows us to uh, get our, our uh, feeders out of, from the substation to uh, where they're needed. It's going to allow us to upgrade Amherst College in the future. There's long-term plans for that, as well as any load growth that's um, going to take place in the downtown section. You know, any, any upgrades, uh, 
we have a lot of uh, customer requests for, you know, new buildings, uh, load growth for, you know, electrifying uh, heat pumps and trying to get away from fossil fuels. So this will give us the infrastructure, uh, almost unlimited infrastructure really to for downtown growth in Amherst. So we think it's a, it's a good project and we're requesting the town's approval for at least the underground portion of that this evening uh, because of the location of the construction our construction window is, short, is pretty much reduced to when uh, Amherst is going to be out of college. Excuse me. So uh, we're looking to get started at. We have bids awarded. We anticipated um, since we've been working so closely with Guilford that um, we would have a favorable outcome here tonight. So that's all. Okay. And, uh, uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Nick and Dylan. They're the project designers and uh, construction supervisors, so they will answer the board's questions. Okay. Council, excuse me. Um, with that, I'm going to ask the two of you to go back to your seats. Uh, we wanna make sure that the public has equal access. Um, and while you're doing that, I'm asking counselors if you have questions at this time. Okay, Mandy Joe, please go ahead. Does Paul want to go for? Oh, I'm sorry, Paul. Thank you. I was just going to remind uh, the council that uh, we have Superintendent of Public Works, Guilford Maureen, who may be able to give you some additional context if that would be helpful to the council. Please. Um, I'm, thank you. I'm going to go ahead. Guilford, please, additional information. Guilford is our superintendent of the Department of Public Works. Good evening. Um, Eversource told you a, a great deal about the project. I mean, I would just like to add, this is the first of many we're going to get to help electrify and improve the services downtown. So the whole purpose of this is to support the new buildings going down, down going in downtown. I'm sorry, I have a bit of an allergy thing going today, but um, so that that's the main purpose of this. Um, and then the side benefit is, is we do get to now get to address the College Street entrance to the town. We'll be able to work with Eversource, and then we'll have to work with Verizon and Comcast to completely remove the, the light poles. And we'll also have to work with Amherst College for that as well. But it's a great project. This is like a once in a lifetime project to actually look at a street when we're done with it, have all the people who use the street, Eversource, Verizon, the town, Comcast, uh, Amherst College come together and, and rebuild a street. So this is going to be a project which goes on another couple of years for us to get our part of the town's part of this done with the street. So I'm really kind of excited if we can't tell. Um, and Eversource has been a great partner working on this. Okay. Paul, anything else? Okay. Mandy Jo Haneke, um, one of our at-large counselors. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, one's kind of a practical question. Um, and then the others are more of the theoretical variety. Um, I'll do the practical one first, which is the petition says the manhole covered or the manholes are six feet by 14 feet by seven feet and eight feet by 14 feet by seven feet. And you never talked about the covers. So I'm kind of like, oh my gosh, are the covers that insanely large or are the covers that are actually at street level that we're going to see much smaller? Is that just the size of the underground hole that you're talking about? And the cover will be the typical manhole cover size. That's the practical one that I, I figure I know the answer, but I thought I'd ask it. Um, the other ones are, I, I just wanna say thank you. This sounds fantastic to start moving lines underground. Um, and you answered one of my questions, which is this will allow at least initially the lines, the electrical lines between South Pleasant and Dickinson on College Street to be moved underground. So my question with that one is what about the other lines that are on all those poles. Guilford kind of mentioned it, but like, is this all of them or is this just the electrical ones? So will the poles have to remain once this is done because not all the lines are gonna be going off of it? Um, and that might actually require a Guilford answer too. And then um, beyond College Street, are places, roads off of College Street going to be able to be go underground due to this project or not is the next question. 
why don't we have you, whoever you're going to send forward. We'll do some uh, introductions. So Nick Kriegel, 181 Mill Valley Road, Belcher Town. I'm the senior supervisor out of the Hadley Work Center. And this is uh, Dylan, I'll let him do the uh, introduction. Hi, Dylan Swabi, S-A-W-A-B-I, 27 Chapin Circle in Ludlow, and I'm out of the Springfield Work Center, 300 Cadwell Drive. And like Nick mentioned, I'm a senior engineer designer here. Sure, to start off, so the manhole covers, they're 36 inch round um, covers, so they're not gonna encompass the entire street. So, Good reassurance, um, thank you. As far as the other streets, um, this will allow for the, the possibility to um, grow into the, the side streets with underground, but it won't encompass them. So we're the, the intent with this project is to tie into the existing overhead um, with the manhole system uh, to the existing overhead systems on the side streets. And the other question was the... It, what the, about the, the non-electrical wires. wires between on College Street between South Pleasant and Dickinson? So as Dylan mentioned, um, you know, working with him to design this project, they've kind of strategically placed manholes at every intersecting street. So as load growth is on those streets, we can build off that manhole system and, you know, take kind of each street at a, at a time when load growth presents itself. Um, as far as the process of, you know, getting those lines underground, it's going to be very similar to the project we worked with Guilford on Spring Street right around the corner a couple of years ago. Um, typically, in that case, I believe the town put in all in the civil infrastructure. In this one, Eversource is putting in the civil infrastructure, so it buys, you know, quite a bit there. Um, but yeah, you are correct that um, our primary wires, the wires at the top of the pole, um, our secondary wires, the wires down just below them, and any kind of transformation equipment on the poles that would be going to underground pad mount type. Um, but at that point, yeah, the other communications would remain until the infrastructure civil products for those um, companies were to be installed and then they could relocate underground as well. And then at the very end, Eversource would come back to pull the poles once all the lines are pulled off of them. Do you have a follow-up question? Oh, okay, Guilford. Oh, sorry. Um, yes, we do have. We will have to go to Ever. I mean, to Verizon and Comcast to work with them, and we'll actually have to work with Five College Fiber as well to get those off the poles. And those will be separate from this work with the um, Eversource. And what do you see? I'm, I'm just going to build on this question and then come to other counselors. What do you see as the time frame for getting all the wires underground in the best possible case scenario? So um, Eversource came to us with this and we started working on it pretty quickly, but it will probably be after Eversource finishes this year, it'll probably be another one to two years to get everything else underground because we'll have to identify funding to apply for some grants and get the numbers and uh, hopefully get some money from Amherst College and from the other two utilities to help us do this. So it and, could be another one to two after this. And once you dig these manholes, will you have to go back in and dig them again or do anything that will be as disruptive as the first round? Once Eversource puts their... Um, their duck bank then they they won't have to go back in because they've actually made plans to stub off of each duck bank down each each side street which is what mr kriegel was talking about so they won't have to go back into college street they may have to go into a part of a side street to get to it um we will the town and comcast and verizon will have to work we'll be working on the south side of the street putting the infrastructure in on that side for um the uh comcast and verizon I'm going to go to Jennifer. Don't leave. I have the feeling you're probably the next response to Jennifer Taub. Uh, well, a little following on what um, you said, I'm just wondering in terms of the, the digging, like what, oh, I'm sorry, what will, how will the public see what's going on? I mean, will there be, I, I'm just trying to get a sense of, I think it's a terrific project, but are streets dug up or is it just a part of small area? Yeah. So this project includes, um, 
along with the manholes, a 12 duct bank concrete encased formation going down the road. Um, you know, PVC conduits, concrete encased. Um, typically, you're going to see for the majority of the street, um, a trench cut uh, approximately four feet deep um, with conduit installed there with concrete encasement. That'll be um, a smaller trench because the formation we're coming down the street um, is typically going to be four conduits wide, three conduits high. So we'll keep it as tight as we can to minimize the amount of blacktop cutting and the amount, you know, we're taking up of the college street. Um, obviously, wherever any manholes are installed, those are, you know, very wide and it'll probably take up in that, you know, short duration area, it'll take up uh, one lane of the road. Um, but typically, um, the, the uh, manhole install can be limited to a day and we're backfilled and we're at that location and we're onto the, you know, smaller trench. Thank you. Do you have other questions, Jennifer, at this point? Oh, no, I was just, I was interested in the, the digging, you know, okay. living near Northampton, it'll be nothing like Northampton Road. Right. So, um, Pam Rooney. Thank you. <clears throat> I was going to ask a similar question, but that was, it was more, um, if we have a trench going down the sidewalk um, from roughly uh, South Pleasant Street all the way to Seeley Street, then it converts over and, and goes into the road. Um, we are really going to be looking at a major construction project on College Street for the next one to two years. Is that correct? Yes, that's that's correct. Thank you. Um, so once you get the 12 duct, the 12 conduits in place, um, I just want to confirm that all of the other, the fiber optics, the, the Verizon lines, everything else that's not electric uh, can actually get housed within that duct bank. Is that correct over time? So that duct bank is, is just an Eversource duct bank. Just an Eversource. Correct. <clears throat> so I have to ask the question, where do all the other lines go? If we are going to actually get the other lines underground, who's going to be doing that and when does that happen? So that work, that work will be the, this year you'll see Eversource doing their work. And then hopefully the beginning of next year, you'll see the town and Verizon and Comcast working to put their utilities underground on the south side of the road. So mm -hmm. the section where the poles are now and the sidewalk on the south side, that will be basically where we can fit in Comcast and Verizon and five college fiber. Thanks. And then the last question I had is that the opening statement was that that um, there will be uh, occasional tie-ins to the overhead system so that we can, quote unquote, electri electrify the downtown and Amherst College. But if I look at the plans, there is only one location, which I think is Dickinson Street, where there's actually shown a connection from the manhole to an overhead pole um, on Dickinson Street. And then the only other location that that occurs is actually down near the substation where there were two or three tie-ins from manholes to, I think, the, the substation by Amherst Media Building. So are we really creating that many opportunities for connection to the downtown if there's really only that one uh, overhead connection on Dickinson Street? So it's not shown on the map here, but there is a, an additional tie-in on Northampton Road. Um, the permitting that we had to obtain from that was through the Mass DOT. Um, so there is another tie-in point just past the intersection, actually the first pole on Northampton Road at the top of the hill at the intersection of Northampton and South Pleasant. Just to clarify, because I found this out the other day, from the center, I guess, of South Pleasant, um, the going west is state highway going east the town owns it okay so it, that's why you had to go to get the yeah so the entire right. manhole duct system will continue through the intersection onto northampton and then reconnect to the existing overhead going down towards the the shopping centers okay thank you uh Pam, anything else? The final question is, um, so who does the repaving for that entire stretch of College Street? Is that town or is that Eversource? So that's something we're still working on how we resolve it. 
Um, we have a project with Amherst College where they want to improve the crosswalk. So they've committed some funds for doing crosswalks. We also have a sewer project in the area that we're doing to connect the sewer line so it doesn't go underneath the um, Tan, Tan Brook, no, Fearing, Fearing Brook. Yeah. And we also have another sidewalk project we're doing. So the town has three projects kind of going on there already, and one's with Amherst College. So we'll, we'll mush all the, hopefully mush all the funds we have together and come out with a paved road, paved sidewalks, new crosswalks, and new lighting. And what's the time frame for that? That's the, well, I was talking about the one to two years. Okay. All right. Okay. Andy Steinberg. Yes, um, we know that there's another hearing following this one regarding um, old locations on Dickinson Street. And uh, I, my question is whether there is linkage between the two in that if there's not positive vote at the same time on both petitions, will that affect the other petition? Because uh, uh, we don't know what's going to happen in the second hearing yet. Yeah, that's fine. So in short, the answer is no to that. Um, we have some flexibility on Dickinson Street and how we configure the poles. That's not going to impact the underground infrastructure. It might impact where that ladder, where that pipe comes up on Dickinson Street, but we are going to work with Mr. Call. Um, we have a meeting with the resident there tomorrow to make sure that we place that pole in a location that is uh, suitable. So uh, we are okay with postponing the vote on respectfully withdrawing that petition for the pole location until we, we work with Mr. Call for the overhead portion. Andy, did that answer your question? Yes, it does. And thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Dorothy. Um, just very quick clarification. Underground wires and everything from um, South Pleasant to Dickinson, or how, how many blocks is it going to go? Yeah, so that is correct. From, from the intersection of South Pleasant um, at the Town Common, um, all the way to Dickinson um, by the entrance of Amherst College, um, mm -hmm. that entrance, the Dickinson entrance of Amherst College. I don't know how many blocks um, without pulling up the map and counting them, but. Just for the purposes of the council, Dickinson is the street right before the railroad mm -hmm. crossing. Thank you. Okay. Well, that sounds great. Thank, thank you very much. Okay. Mandy Jo, you have your hand up. Yeah. Um, my question actually directly relates to that. Is there a reason why the lines won't be going underground with the duct bank going from Dickinson all the way to the substation? Why aren't the corresponding lines on the poles that are between Dickinson and the substation going underground too? So we recently tried to encompass um after working with Guilford bearing these lines, um, there's some heavy equipment on those poles right at that intersection to feed Amherst College, mainly metering equipment um, that we don't have the um, current real estate for. Um, there's nothing saying that at a, at a future date, we couldn't look at that option. But right now um, for this project, it seemed that that was the, the most beneficial to bury those lines from Dickinson to the town common. You know the most impact to the town. Other questions from the council. I I should have put my hand up. Um, so, how much is this going to cost the town? The Eversource project. Yes. So the Eversource project is a Eversource funded project. So there there is no cost to the town for our capital project. Okay, Guilford. So we haven't worked out the final numbers on the second part of the project yet. We do. Do you, do you see this as the type of project that will attract grant money? Um, I'm, I'm hoping it does. Um, I really am. I'm also hoping that 
Verizon and Eversource, I mean, Verizon and uh, Comcast will chip in as their fellow utility to make a nice improvement. And then Amherst College is also talking about what they might chip in as well. Once the project is completed with the ideal that all of these wires from all of these different companies and Amherst College are now underground, who will take the poles down? Eversource will. Okay. The, so the poles belong to Eversource. Correct. Eversource is joint owners with Verizon, but there are set areas. So we would we would remove them once once all utilities are off of them. Okay. And then do you repair the area around the pole? Yes, correct. So most of these pole, um most of most of these poles are in grass belt. So we would make repairs to the grass belt. Okay. Um Guilford, this is really getting beyond this, but uh, perhaps we'll talk about it in finance tomorrow. The rest of College Street. Needless okay. to say, it's mostly in my in Pat's in my district, and boy, do we hear about it. So, okay. And it, one more question. Uh, you are restoring or you're doing something with the crosswalks for Amherst College. When those crosswalk walks were originally installed, I my understanding is that our emergency vehicles uh, would start taking other routes because they could not exactly fly over the um, crosswalks because they were so high. Is part of your project changing those crosswalks or is that part of the town's project or Amherst College project? The Eversource is actually gonna take out the concrete and paver and put in asphalt but they'll still be raised crosswalks and as we do the crosswalk renovation that Amherst College was talking about they'll stay as raised crosswalks and I assume Amherst College is going to come with, to us with a request as keepers of the public way we're working out how we do that because now this project this project if you'd asked me about this project six months ago, I would have told you it didn't exist because it didn't. Um, this has been something that just kind of came out. Eversource saw a need and started pushing it really hard because they need to do it to support the town. And it's growing and we're, we're, the project's just rolling really big. It's going to be a great little project for us all done. Sounds like it. I hope our residents have the patience to get through it. Um, uh, Pam? I have one non-public um, hearing question, and that is while all the Eversource people are here, what is the rough time frame for finishing the completion of new phone pole or new new pole installation? We have lots and lots of poles with old lines still attached to the old poles. Um, just would love to hear when that all gets wrapped up. Thank you. Yeah, so we um we certainly focus on our double poll counts every week. We have a meeting to discuss internally. Um, we try to turn them around as quick as we can. Um, but obviously, as you know, with this project, everybody's attached. So we use an internal system that once we're off the poll, it goes right to the next contractor telling them, hey, you're up. You know, you need to go move your lines. Unfortunately, we don't have um, a ton of um uh we, we can't put a ton of pressure on those other companies because they are separate companies. Um we notify them and um you know from the time that that poll comes back to eversource saying hey it's ready to pull we get right on it so um typically we try to keep ours um well below 90 days more in the 30-day range but obviously that's you know every company um has a part in that okay um i don't see any other counselor hands so i'm going to ask you to step back again and we're gonna to move to public comment. And I'm gonna ask if you're in the audience, uh, how many people do we have uh, to? And uh, if you are an attendee by Zoom at this time, please raise your hand if you would like to make public comment. I'm, I'm sorry, thank you. It's for the hearing regarding the Eversource petition to install new underground electric duct bank from South Pleasant Street to College Street. 
You ready? Aaron, Athena? Aaron, you're up. Please come up to the mic, say your name and address before you make your comment. I have to say, I don't think I missed the banging on the wall to get the media to start at the Iris session. I'm, I'm Aaron Hayden. Um, today, I'm wearing the uh, Campus Utilities Engineer hat for Amherst College. Um, I maybe uh, am in the best position in the college to understand the impact of this project, both the long-term benefits of it. It's going to be, uh, it's, 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 as I see it, the vision is to improve the availability of electricity of power downtown to help the decarbonization. That's, that's good. Um, it's going to help the reliability of the system too. We um, all know about uh, winter storms and car accidents involving poles. Um, it's also going to have the added benefit, and I guess this is a little bit new, of undergrounding some of the wires. Now, we hear that it's only the high voltage wires which are going down now, the low voltage and the, the cable will go down later, I hope. Um, the college, um, we really appreciate the collaboration that has happened between uh, the, pub the public works and the college in organizing this project and getting it ready. The uh, college is probably going to, no, not probably. The college is the abutter that will be most acutely affected by the work on this project. Yeah, they're gonna be working in the road, but I get daily delivers, deliveries where they have to close the whole road to put in a manhole at Sealy Street. I have uh, two major construction projects going on on campus um, with large trucks that will be going many, many times. We're gonna put a lot of traffic onto uh, Route 9 on College Street. Uh, I have really valued the work that we've done with, with Guilford um, and by extension with the town to organize all of that to reduce the impact on the campus. Uh, it also helps us realize and for us to offer you know, the little things that can help out when they're working in the sidewalk uh, between Sealy Street and the um, and South Pleasant, um, they're going to probably park on our lawn a little bit, and th that's going to be okay. We'll, we'll be okay. We'll help them out with that as much as possible. Also, the spurs that go off, uh, those will impact us and that we have to figure out how to dig and where to put the, the new green boxes that will be associated with that. Again, you know, the collaboration, the work that we've been done with the public works and with the folks behind me has been great. Uh, we really appreciate that. So we very much support this project. Um, the um, I, one comment I would like to make uh, is that I really appreciate the new maps that you all get. There was a time when I sat on the other side of the table when we didn't get nearly as much information. This is this is really great that that you're getting that. And you know, I really appreciate their help in helping us understand what it is. Change is hard. And this is a big change uh, in many ways. And I'm counting on it being for the best. So thank you very much. Thank you. I just want to clarify that we're talking about College Street from South Pleasant to Dickinson. Yes. Thank you. Are there other, is there other public comment? No, not for this one. You're for the other one. Okay, thank you. Are there any people in the audience who would like to make public comment? Please bring yeah, um, I should wear my glasses. Shut up. I, yeah, 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 Gary yeah, 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 yeah. Sanchez. Hello? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Athena. Are there any other people in the audience who would like to make public comment? Okay, Anna, you have your hand up. I do. I had not um, previously felt the need to uh, file a disclosure for this. I'm an employee of Amherst College, but after hearing the enthusiasm from the college, which is great uh, for this project, I feel like I need to specify that while I work for Amherst College, this decision or vote has no impact on my employment, nor is it impacted by my employment at the college. And I will happily file a non, uh, what's it called? A disclosure form with the clerk of the, um, with the town clerk. 
it's just, it'll do, I'll do it right now. So it'll be a little late, Thank you. but just, uh, just to clarify, no, I do not feel there's any conflict of interest in voting in this hearing. Stack them up with all the rest of them. Um, okay. Uh, seriously. <laughs> Are there any other comments from public? Are there any follow-up questions from the council? Jennifer. So I guess as we get closer, we'll um, have a conversation, I guess, with DPW about how this will affect traffic. I guess it's such it's one lane in each direction on College Street there. But I know we have to bite the bullet. But Gilford? We'll yes, <clears throat> I mean, this has not just been me working with everybody, it's my staff too, Jason Skeels and um, <clears throat> Jimmy, Jim Jordan has also been working with them. And as they've been posting notices for Route 9, we'll be doing the same thing like you always do for how it's going, works going on college, on college street while we do this. We, we'll, we kind of like do that constantly. So yes, they will be talking and passing things out. Okay. Are there any other questions from the council? then I'm going to move to close the public hearing on the Eversource petition to install new underground electric duck banks from South Pleasant to Dickinson Street along to, College to Street. To the Eversource substation. To the Eversource substation, thank you. I wanna make sure that the clerk of the council has the motion as it needs to be stated. Is there a I'll, second? I'll second. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Seeing none, then we're going to go to a vote. This time we start with Anna Devlin Gothier. Hi. Lynn Griesmers and I, Mandy Johanneke. Hi. Anika Lopes. Hi. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane is absent. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmilm. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Okay. So the hearing's closed, but we haven't voted. That's after we get done with the next hearing. Okay. Um, so the next hearing that we're opening is the public hearing regarding Eversource's petition to install a new pole and relocate a pole adjacent to 140 Dickinson Street. Would you like to speak to the petition? Yes, at this time, we would like to respectfully withdraw that petition until we uh, meet with Mr. Call. So Thank you. Submit once we... Uh, we uh, make sure we put that poll in the location that's uh, suitable. Athena? So, uh, we'd like to suggest leaving the hearing open so that we don't have to re-notice it. Okay. Yeah. That'd be great. Okay. So uh, the council can continue the hearing to okay. a future meeting date. Would that be acceptable? Uh, and that's acceptable to okay. us. That's can I ask, beneficial for us. You said you were going to meet, meet with him tomorrow, I believe. We are meeting with him tomorrow. Right. So would you like to plan to come back as early as June 5th? June 5th. We, we should have, yes. Okay, so then I'm going to make, but, them, yes, go we ask some questions so that they have sure. them, their meeting. <laughs> we're, we're actually officially in the hearing. So even though you're withdrawing the present plan and no, no they're no, not, not withdrawing. withdrawing, even though you may modify the present plan. How's that? Okay, Mandy Jo. Thank you, because I think it'll pertain to the meeting tomorrow with Mr. Call. Um, I noticed there's a poll. There are two polls near the two you're proposing to add but one of them you're proposing to move. So we're going from two poles to three poles according to your plan. Um, but my question is, why aren't we going two to two? <laughs> like there's one sort of on the other side of the driveway that's currently there that is proposed, I guess, to stay there. And I'm not sure why that one's proposed to stay. Could that one be, it's, it's the southernmost one in blue. Well that's above College Street, that's north of College Street, the one directly below the two proposed ones, that one. Um, why is that one not being proposed to be eliminated? So that poll is an existing poll, and the reason that 
that pole isn't being eliminated is because we're going to be bringing conduit from the intersection to the uh, the proposed relocation pole in the middle there. Um, and then the set the pole just below that, it's going to be an isolating device for the campus's primary meter. So that pole that you're seeing um, just northerly of the, on Dick, or the northern part of uh, College Street in Dickinson, that's where it rises down to feed the campus. So that's a primary meter there. So we, we're not eliminating that. So there's, there's one pole on the top of the page that's being relocated to the middle pole. So there's the pole to be relocated, that's 34 over two. We're moving that 47 feet southerly. So that pole will remain there, just we're moving it uh, southerly. And there will be a, a new pole set, which I have listed 110 feet northerly of the intersection and 16 feet off the center line of Dickinson Street. And so there it's will a remain one for two, but, pole, sorry? And there will remain a pole 20 feet south of that right on the other side of the driveway. Uh, yes, there's a there's a green belt there um, or tree belt there. So it, I don't remember exactly, but I, I, it may be across from the driveway, which is um, the concern that one of the residents brought up, which is what we'd like to address tomorrow. No, I, I'm talking about the one in the light blue outline, that one. Yes. I, I guess I'm still not quite understanding why that one can't be eliminated. Are, are literally lines going to be going across the street, even though we've just put everything underground between that pole and the one that's on the south side of yeah. College Street? So what it is, it's a, it's it's one pole that's being relocated. So it's one additional pole. And so the reason we can't uh, fully eliminate it is because it's it coincides with that existing pole, the primary meter. It serves as an isolating device to to shut off that primary meter. So by extending conduit up the road, we're going to attach to an existing pole to reconnect. So that itself is one piece of equipment. So we have to relocate that pole or the piece of equipment that's on it to accommodate the new underground. And because we're relocating it, there's going to be a new protection device on it to um, isolate that primary meter, which is for the campus there. So one pole is to bring the underground up and reconnect to the existing overhead. And the and because that pole is existing, it already has an isolating device. So we're just re relocating the isolating device to accommodate the new underground. Um, does that does that help answer the question? Mandy Joe, follow up. And why can't that isolating device be located on the new pole that's going to be twenty feet north of it? Well, the, the light blue pole itself is the actual metering the equipment to Amherst College. So the the light blue pole is really where the underground portion is going to start. We, when we worked with Guilford to try to figure a location where we can start the underground process, we, we chose to do it just after Amherst College primary meeting, the two feeds going into the college, because that does tie right into their automatic switch gear where they have auto flop over. So the, the relocation of those poles and that infrastructure there is, is would involve, um, Quite a bit of work from the college and 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 a lot of coordination and it's something that i know as the college upgrades their services and we're looking at bringing another feeder in that may very well happen but for the sake of this project and and getting the the lines buried going up through through the common area this this was kind of our delineation delineation point and because of that we do need the extra pole to really bring up the infrastructure and being able to isolate them properly if they do have uh uh, a fault in their in their service. So, um, Mindy Joe, Paul, you have your hand up. Yeah, I think the message to the EverSource is as you consult with your your the abutter that the consistent uh, comments from the council has been we they want to reduce the number of poles in town, not increase the numbers. At least keep it the same. And I think that's what the councilor is talking about. Is like. Why are we increasing the number of poles? And if you can look at it as you re look at it in context of what the abutter says, maybe there's a creative way to keep the same number of poles versus adding a pole. So just to, you can take that back and think about that. Certainly. Um, okay, Anna, 
Hi, my question, I'm over here. Um, hi, my question is more of a process question and it might go to you all. It actually might go to Athena. One of the reasons why we were in the um, situation with the abutter is that the notice, uh, he received the notice, I believe three business days before the hearing, including today. Um, I'm curious if there's part of our process that requires abutter notifications to be sent out a certain amount of time in advance to give folks an amount of time to reach out and meet if they want to. And I want to thank you all for meeting with us about it. It seems like that's going to be really productive and helpful. So no, this is not a critique on that process. I'm, it's more curious from our end if there's a if there's a time frame. Yes, they're they're required to be sent 10, ten days in advance. So it's unfortunate that it took that long in the mail. Yeah. Yeah, we do send them out 10 days okay, in advance. Thank you. Eversource provides the butter cards to us. And then once we have the hearing date sent, we send them out. That's what I thought based on conservation commission requirements for the butter notification. So thank you for confirming. Okay. Got to support our USPS apparently a little bit more. Thanks. Paul, you still have your hand up. Dorothy. Dorothy, you're muted. Thank you. Right. Okay. So really uh, agreeing with Mandy Joe to reduce the polls and Paul did say it correctly. So uh, when he explained why the polls were there, I have to admit, I, I couldn't follow it. But I understand that people who are skilled in this very complex business had made a plan, and that was the plan, and it seemed to work for them. So I, I just wanted to do an imagination exercise. Uh, pretend that Mr. Call's house was the house of the president of Amherst College. Would you then find a way, I, this is obviously a very complex thing, to make it the poll so they didn't kind of stand right there blocking his at his driveway because I understand this is money, but uh, it's also the kind of thing that makes a place look awful. Just poll after poll, and I've got a whole bunch of new ones on my street, um, and this is a beautiful area. So um, I'm just hoping that more imagination can go into how to not have and and Mandy Joe's right. She's always catching when they they pull the lines across the street. And that's something that we really want to avoid, uh, that whole tangle of wires uh, that uh, blocks our, our architecture and our houses. So um, would it be different if that were the president's house? That's it. Guilford? No, it would not. I mean, I think we, we work with every resident that uh, has a concern when we send out these about our notifications and try to place polls in the least impactful location if possible you know there's a, there's times when we can't we do think there's opportunity here to uh find an agreeable solution that's gonna uh satisfy mr call from our initial conversation that we had with him today we do think that uh we're gonna be able to uh, come up with a solution there that's gonna work we are also reviewing some um of our standards here and we're looking at the possibility there's a reliability function that, that that additional switch is going to allow us to isolate the school and, and pick up load quicker if in the event that does something that we do have uh, a cable fault there so uh, we're currently also reviewing that if the in the event that we cannot get this poll that you know if if, if it's something that we want to relocate our facilities down down further or actually just uh, know that we have a less than ideal operational situation there that we can work around. So that's another reason that we want to uh, come back to the board with some more information at the next hearing. Okay. Guilford, do you have your hand up? Yes, but Pam can go and I'll just, my comment is an overall comment. Okay. Uh, Pam, thank you. Um, yeah, one last comment for me, and that is given the emphasis on supplying Amherst College with power and the fact that there's a real concentration of whatever they are, transformers or, or whatever's on the north side of College Street at that location, why not one more section of duct bank that passes under College Street to the south side where all of Amherst College's infrastructure can be assembled and distributed across the campus? Why not one more chunk and, and really serve them well? It would take... Um... A, a considerable amount of infrastructure upgrades from the college as well and in order to uh, be able to facilitate feeding them underground. Mostly the primary metering equipment has uh, very long lead times and uh, we would need a footprint in a very congested area for some large equipment to be able to meter them. So 
that is why it's not included in the scope of this particular project right here. Certainly as the college upgrades their infrastructure and we have, I think, um, long-term plans again of bringing another, a new feeder there to, be able to uh, be able to add growth in the college at that point. I can't say for sure that, you know, because we don't have the scope of that project at this moment, but um, it was, we were not able to include it in the scope of this one at this time. Okay. Guilford, do you have your hand up? Yeah, I just want to make a general comment. Um, I know, and we work really hard with Eversource to get rid of the poles, but it's not like a water system or a sewer system where everything can be underground. Um, there ha there's, safe there's a lot more safety issues and reliability and access issues with electrical units than with some of our other utilities. So as they do this, there's going to have to be a question you ask yourself is, do you have another pole just because one pole can't hold everything? One pole can't hold everything. Um, so you need to put something on the ground. And now you're going to see a green transformer on the ground. Um, and it's probably, I mean, as we've been told by other people, they don't like seeing green transformers. But uh, as, as we keep moving this process, electrifying and, and building the reliability back into downtown, you're going to have to think about as as keepers of the way, where do we put transformers and switch gear that can't actually go underground? So Eversource works really hard and we work really hard to try to find things and put things in places where we can hide them and people don't see them. But um, there will be times when you'll have to have, maybe you have to have a pole but it's just because it's safer to have a pole than it is to have it on the ground. Or you may have to have a ground mount something a transformer switch because it's safer. Um, so those are just things to think about in the future. I know the goal is to get rid of all the poles, but sometimes you can't get rid of all the poles. Sort of like a sewer system. We have pump stations around town. Everybody complains about some of our pump stations. They don't look very nice, but if you don't have the pump station, then the sewage doesn't get to go to the next place it needs to go. Um, so this is just a comment. Okay. Are there other counselor questions at this time? Um, the floor is now open for public comment. If you are in the audience, um, we're going to have you come forward, please. Matthew Cornell, please come on up. Get your name and address before you make your comment. All right. It's Matthew Cornell. Uh, I live at 34 Dickinson Street. It's that green Victorian where Spring Street intersects Dickinson. And it wasn't until I saw the map that I understood, I think, that there's no impact to our house is that true to the um, the work stop at the parking lot of Amherst College there on Dickinson Street? I need to ask somebody back there to answer that question. I don't want to chew up my three minutes here. I think we can be generous. Okay. okay. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Well, I don't have to ask any, any more questions then. Um, I appreciate the work that they do to have the service there so reliably uh, in the town. Um, I saw the last thing is, I saw 140 Dickinson Street referenced. I don't think there's a 140. There's a 140 College Street. Um, I might be wrong, though. Uh, we'll check the address. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Are there any other public comments, people on Zoom? Okay. Are there any other comments from counselors at this time? So Athena, do we need a motion to continue the hearing? Yes, you should pick a date and a time. Okay, Mandy Joe is going to make the motion. I'll move to continue the public hearing on the Eversource petition to install a new pole and relocate a pole adjacent to, is it 140 College Dickinson Street? Dickinson. We're, we're confirmed it's 140 Dickinson Street to June 5, 2023 at 6.35 p.m. Second. I just want okay. Athena to confirm that that's a fine time. Still second. We don't have any other special meetings happening before the regular meeting, so I think 635 is okay as Excellent. long as it's okay with you, Lynn. Excellent. Okay. Uh, so the motion has been made to continue the hearing. It's been made and seconded. It will come back before the council. Uh, we assume with some changes in plans. And uh, 
that will be on June 5 at 635. Is there any question from the council? We just need a vote. I know. Okay. I'm just wait, making sure that everybody's on board with what we're doing because we don't normally continue hearings. Okay. Then in this case, I'm going to begin the vote with Lynn Griesmer. It's an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane is absent. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmilne. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. And Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. It's unanimous with one absent. Uh, we are going to um, just hang in. Yeah, that's my, my plan. So skipping around on the agenda just a bit, okay? I'm going to move to action item 8A, okay? And the motion under 8A that I'm placing on the table is as follows. To approve the order for poll location at Meadow Street, that's not the right one, huh? Yeah. So. Okay. Go ahead. So it's to approve the order for underground, new underground electrical duct bank from South Pleasant Street to Eversource substation along College Street. Um, and then we need to add the dates that I have to look up. I'm looking to Athena. Yeah, so let me see if I can find it. Dated 13 of March, 2023. Dated March 13th, 2023, as indicated on the plan marked, gosh, um, 8039687611764978. Okay, second to. Is there any further discussion or question? This means we're approving the big project, okay? All right, with that, I'm going to move to the polling vote. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Uh, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane is absent. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmin. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devon Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. It's unanimous with one absent. Thank you. We'll see you on the 5th. I'm going to move back to the general order of the agenda, which means we are now at general public comment. Okay. Um, there's nobody left in the room except for the counselors, Paul and Athena and our clerk. Um, if you would like to make public comment and you are on Zoom, please raise your hand at the Please raise your hand at this time. I see no hands. And so we're going to keep moving on. We've already done the um, consent agenda uh, and under resolutions and proclamations, Um, we are now back to um, the 
potential for a motion to amend the proclamation recognizing June as LGBTQ plus Pride Month. Mandy Jo, did I miss something? No, I'd like to make a motion. Okay. I move to adopt the proclamation recognizing June as lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, plus LGBTQ plus Pride Month with as amended by amending the final two whereas clauses to add the words, quote, including our youth, end quote, after the word resident in each clause. Can you place the it on the agenda on the thing? Okay, there's been a motion made. I second. need a second. second. Pat's a second. Okay. I'm waiting for it to go on the screen. Sorry, I That's can't okay. do it that fast. Take your time. Are you looking for the proclamation or a motion up on the screen? The point of order, Lynn. The way it has point been of order, Lynn. Yes. Um, I sent the, I think the language that Mandy just suggested um, over to Athena um, in a Word document. So if Athena can find that, she should be able to just pull that up. Okay. All right. Right. But, but, but you want the entire proclamation. You can just show us that paragraph. Yeah. What Michelle sent is just a motion. I, I would have to go in and change the, the proclamation now, but I can okay. do that. Let's take our time and do that so that everybody's clear what we're voting on. Okay. Athena, do you need, did I, I can't remember if I sent you a word version of it. You do, Okay, good. Sorry. Just making sure. I think that phrase will need commas both before and after it that I didn't quote. Okay. It's including the youth. It, it was including our youth. Our youth, yeah. Okay, so um, as one of the um, sponsors of the proclamation, the motion has been made and seconded. And Michelle, then are you agreeing that this captures what you were looking for earlier? Absolutely, yeah, thank you very much. All right, so the motion is on the floor. Um, uh, to approve this as it has been amended. Is there any other question or comment? Okay. Seeing none, we're going to move to the tally vote. Uh, we're going to start with Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Uh, yes. Pam Rooney? Yes. Kathy Shane's absent. Andy Steinberg? Hi. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Alicia Walker? Yes. Shalini Balmil? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke? Aye. It um, is unanimous with one counselor absent. Could we recognize Anna Devlin Gothier? Yes, Anna. Thank you. Since its inception, the Pride Month proclamation has held a slightly different meaning each year as it is impacted by the country we live in uh, and the consistent fight for people to be empowered to live their lives as their true and authentic selves. I'm truly grateful for Pat and Mandy's work on this year's proclamation, as well as for former counselor Evan Ross, who authored the original version. Sometimes we hear comments about the need for Pride Month celebrations or similar proclamations in a town like Amherst. Uh, 
This sentiment applies to a variety of other historically and currently harmed communities as well. It is easy to not look too closely and to see everything in our community and our area as fully and perfectly inclusive of LGBTQ plus folks. Those of us who are in the LGBTQ community or have loved ones who are in the LGBTQ community know that there is no such thing as a bubble of protection from hate or bias. It shows up in subtle ways. It shows up in obvious ways, all of them causing harm. In the past few weeks, another damning example of this harm came to light, this time with the youth of our community in a place that should be one of learning and support. While our proclamations and flag raisings are symbolic, symbols carry power. Let this proclamation carry power in its message of love, care, compassion, and fight. We will continue to fight, continue to love, and continue to care for our community. To our LGBTQ residents and visitors, and especially our youth, we see you, we support you, we celebrate you, and we're gonna fight like hell for you and alongside you. We hope that you will come celebrate and uplift one another on June 2nd at 4 p.m. and throughout the month at a variety of opportunities around town. With that, I would like to invite Mandy Jo Haneke to read the final statements from the 2023 Pride Month Proclamation. Thank you. Now, therefore, we, the Amherst Town Council, do hereby proclaim June 2023 as LGBTQ plus Pride Month. Be it further proclaimed, we, the Amherst Town Council, encourage all residents to celebrate and affirm our proud and diverse LGBTQ plus community year round. Be it further proclaimed that this proclamation will be recognized by raising the Progress Pride flag on the UN flagpole from June 2nd to June 30th, 2023. Anna already mentioned that the flag raising will be at 4 p.m. We are looking forward to um, welcoming everyone to that and especially our SAGA members who have helped be the community sponsor to the Pride Proclamation this year. Great. Are there any other comments at this time? then we are going to move on presentations and discussions. There are none. We have already dealt with action item 8A. Action item 8B has been delayed until uh, June 5th after the continuation of the hearing. That brings us to 8C, which is the proposed bylaw ensuring safe access to legally protected reproductive and gender affirming health care. This is sponsored by Anna and Mandy Joe, there will be a motion. Um, in fact, I'll ask one of them to make the motion um, and to refer to GOL. So let's begin with the motion and then we'll go on to the rest of the presentation for the two of you. Mandy Jo? Anna. Excuse me. <laughs> um, well, now I want to make it right and I'm worried I'm going to do it wrong. All right, um, I would like to move, I had it, I lost it. I would like to move that the town council refer uh, the, the draft bylaw ensuring safe access to legally protected reproductive and gender affirming health care to, uh, to GOL for a report back within, see reading the motion sheet would have been the helpful thing to do. And, and I was reading the bylaw uh, for a substantive review. And a review of clarity, review consistency, and, and clarity. I assumed they would do that. Do you want me to start over? <laughs> okay. Uh, as well as clarity, consistency, and actionability. And the report back. And they were report back within 60 days. To the council, July 7th. July, July 7th. 7th. Woof, man. You're never going to call on me again. By July 7th, no, please. I'm going to. I'm going to. 17th, please. Would you I'm like me to do it again? Advanced warning instead, okay? I will second uh, that as written on the motion sheet. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want me to read? It that? was identical. <laughs> what? That's good. That's good. All right. So um, it wasn't good, but that's okay. To, uh, speak to the pre speak to the motion or speak to the bylaw. Yes, please. Uh, I'll try to do better at this. So this bylaw is uh, it's preventative in nature. And 
what it does is it looks at our state level protections and looks at what we have an obligation to do at a local level. So if you read our memo, you will have noticed that there we talked about the one of the origins of this was the 2022 ruling from the Supreme Court on Dobbs v. Jackson, Jackson, which overturned Roe v. Wade. We have talked about this. We have written resolutions about this. Uh, and what we are trying to do is to reinforce the July 2022 state level action signed by Governor Baker, which was an act expanding protections for reproductive and gender affirming care. Um, and the reason that this is especially important in Amherst is that we need to make sure in a community that sees so many residents coming in from other states, states that may not be uh, supporting their, their own residents in receiving gender affirming care, in receiving uh, reproductive care and receiving abortion care, all of that, we need to make sure that if they are pursuing that care here, they are able to do it without fear of, uh, of their information being shared in with people from their home states who might be seeking it. Uh, and so this the state law doesn't specifically address the things that we are trying to address in our local bylaws. So this is supposed to be, this is intended as a reinforcement at the local level of that state level action, making sure we've covered all of all of their all of any potential gaps that exist to protect our residents and receiving the care that they deserve to receive. Mandy, do you have anything to add? Nope. Okay. Uh, there's a motion on the floor for referral, and it's an opportunity now for counselors who have questions, should the motion pass, or things that you want to make sure that GOL pays particular attention to. Pam Roney. Can you kindly give some examples of the gaps? Um, it occurred to me when I read it that, in fact, <clears throat> Massachusetts covers a great deal of this, why is there something at a local level needed that is not already available under mass law? Mandy, do you want to take this one? So the, the Massachusetts law really focused on um, people, the lawsuits, you know, Texas, in some sense, has has authorized lawsuits for people who tra traverse borders, their borders, leave Texas to come to states like Massachusetts to receive reproductive health care and, and um, gender affirming care. And then um, the state law really focused on how to protect those individuals from those lawsuits, um, the actual lawsuit. And what we're trying to do is to ensure that our town doesn't help those lawsuits proceed by providing information to anyone who might have filed the lawsuit. The state law doesn't appear from our readings to cover the provision of that information or the, um, the holding of individuals if there were a warrant out for someone's arrest based on some of those lawsuits and criminal filings. Texas has also done criminal filings um, and, and criminal complaints. And so, you know, as Anna said, it's a preventative measure. Um, we would hope it would never have to be used, but if those, those laws that have been passed in states like Texas um, begin to be used against people who may come to Massachusetts for their care or who live in Massachusetts um, um, we and help people who came to Massachusetts. We want to ensure that it's they're not going to get help from the town. Um, we don't want to wait till it's already happened. We want that here to, to state, you know, we are not going to help you. We did this very similarly um, with immigration laws. Um, back a number of years ago, it might almost be a decade now, I think, where we did this. And it was it was somewhat preventative, but in the end, it did get used, I, I believe. So, and it became very important that while it might have been preventative the, at the time we were considering adopting at our town meeting was, it became a very important thing to have on the books. Andy. Yeah, I mean, I, my, my question is along, I think, where Pam was going, too. 
I have uh, stated previously that I'm concerned that we are making a lot of reactions of referring bylaws to committees that take a lot of time of committees and have really begun in many circumstances to uh, bog down our council processes and our committee processes and that we also uh, are uh, passing bylaws at times that uh, don't readily address uh, an issue that is likely to occur. So I was just, I had, my question was pretty similar and I think you've answered part of it, but I'm still not really comfortable in that um, I haven't seen a real demonstration that there's any likelihood um, or any significant likelihood that um, what is being talked about, which is town participation, um, given the fact that providing information would be uh, for anybody who had information that was uh, in in involved HIPAA would already be, um, there's already legal prohibitions that have much stronger consequences than we're talking about. And uh, for, um, and so I've, I've still not quite clear in my head as to why it is that this is needed other than that we feel, and I think that it is important to make a statement, but um, a statement in a bylaw um, is a big leap between the two. And I'm still not entirely sure why the bylaw is necessary. Lynn, may I respond? Yes, please, go ahead. So Respectfully, Andy, I think what you were saying says more about our committee processes than it does about our bylaws. And I think that if we start going down a road of not doing our jobs because we don't know how to run effective committee processes, that's that's a problem in my mind and needs to be addressed more from the process angle than from the legislative angle. Uh, if we only legislate reactively, we're doing a disservice to our residents. I've really strongly feel that this is, it is not, uh, or I don't think it's a safe assumption to say that this isn't likely to occur. So many people said that Roe would stand as the law of the land, right? I don't think that we can make any of those guarantees. And there are so many people out there right now looking for these loopholes, looking for the opportunities to, to pursue people who are seeking the care. Uh, we need to ensure that we are matching and outpacing them in protecting the rights of our residents. And there's a, you're right, there is a difference between making a statement through a proclamation or a resolution and putting a bylaw in place. And to me, and I don't want to speak for Mandy, but I believe for Mandy as well, this issue deserves and has opportunity for a bylaw to back it up. Our proclamations don't stand anything against folks coming in to try to get information or, or um, to, to seek that out. And I don't think that our, our town employees or our, our town, um, all the folks who are covered under our definition uh, are trying to share it, but we wanna protect them and having a reason that they can say, no, I'm not going to. And this gives them that. And you, Joe? And I, I talk a lot about information sharing, but there are parts of this bylaw that refer to holding in custody, those who have aided or assisted those seeking reproductive and general gender affirming care. Um, much of that information is not legally protected healthcare information that would fall under HIPAA. So not everything that could be asked for or could happen is HIPAA protected um, or covered by the recent Baker signed law that we referenced. And so we're just trying to ensure that we've done what we can to protect our residents and those who might come into Amherst seeking care. Andy, do you have a follow-up question? 
just a fi quick follow-up comment, and then I'm going to lower my hand, and that uh, final comment is uh, to what uh, Anna said. Uh, yeah, I mean, it is about our processes, but our processes um, are complex because they need to be complex, uh, and they involve also getting advice from council and other things because uh, other costs uh, complexities uh, go with it. And uh, I think that the discussion actually has served the major purpose that I brought forward that I really think that the council needs to have this discussion and not just make automatic knee-jerk referrals um, I think we now have had a discussion and I appreciate the responses. Um, I'm trying to imagine a situation that where this would occur, okay? And first of all, I there's no question in my mind that I wanna protect the rights of all of our residents and, um, you know, the the lack of import, the, anyway, the whole situation that is brought up by this. So I just want to be very clear about that from the beginning. My concern about a bylaw by like this is describe the situation in which it could occur. Describe what the town would be doing to protect the individual. And then describe the enforceability of the bylaw. I, so I'm having, I, I mean, I, when we did immigration, it allowed us with any number of actions and testimony to continue to protect Julia. And with the unbelievable gift that um, the church gave us in all of that. I'm just trying to figure out what this looks like. Okay, and um, so Mandy Jo, you want to speak to that? Um, I'll try two hypothetical situations um, that don't necessarily involve HIPAA information. Um, the first is, I'm just going to pick myself. I decide to help a friend who lives in Texas obtain some reproductive health care in Massachusetts. And someone in Texas files I don't know, is it criminal now? Civil both maybe? Um, a, a, a civil lawsuit against me and then Texas itself files a criminal lawsuit against me. Um, when that criminal uh, charge is filed against me, they send the warrant for arrest up to Amherst because I live in Amherst. Mm -hmm. This bylaw would prevent Amherst, would, would allow the Amherst PD to say, no, we're not going to execute that warrant. No. And we're not going to extradite. That's what this bylaw would do. A second um, example, similar, say the person I helped got care at the Musanti Health Center. Mm -hmm. um, yes, whatever care they might have received in the center might be protected by HIPAA, but there's video cameras. And say the lawsuit that was filed seeks the video cameras from the town videos at the doors to the Banks Center. Um, this would prohibit the town from distributing and releasing those videos to the people seeking them. Okay, thank you for those examples. Dorothy? Um, I, I find similarity here with the fugitive slave law and Massachusetts uh, was known for trying to fight against that. And this, the language of these new laws are coming from the same place. It is not rational. They both relate to human bondage and that they will stop at nothing. And they like to do some demonstrations like sending the, the uh, bus load of people, or maybe it was a boat load of people to Martha's Vineyard. I can imagine there might be some staged events where they're trying to snatch people and do exactly what Mandy Joe is saying to try to put fear in the citizens of the of um, Massachusetts um, that their 
laws will not stand and that the laws of Texas or Kentucky or whatever, Utah, are going to come and supersede ours. So, um, you know, it's a small thing, but I think that we have to be prepared. They, you know, in the age of media and filming everything, I would expect there's going to be some some things that people have in mind. And we and Mandy Joe's right. We have to have we have to have the oh, police and law firms notified ahead of time and thinking about it and thinking about what they would do and how they would do things. So I say it's a small step and it's not complete and it's got this lot more work to do on it. But I think it's a it's a start and it's something that we have to do because this is this is where the battle is now. And I think that some of it will come to Amherst. Okay. Thank you. Michelle. I have a couple of questions and a comment. Um Mandy, uh, just coming back to your um, first example, um, right now under the state law, uh, would you be protected as the state law stands um, if they, as you said, passed on that, uh, you know, criminal charge came to the to the police department and said, you know, would you be protected already? Um, give me a couple minutes. I have to go back to read the law. Okay, um, absolutely. And and just along that line, I would imagine we would seek a legal review for this. Okay, great. Um, and then I wanted to just say with respect to process, um, I do appreciate Andy's concern um, and Pam's concern. And um, I do appreciate that we're having this discussion prior to referring it. Um, but I also want to say that, you know, I'm really happy to see that we're like scaffolding this beyond the original resolutions, um, you know, so we we have these resolutions that we've already um, approved as a town council, and now we're taking it to that next step um, and moving beyond a speech act. And, um, and, and so I just, I'm really appreciating that. And um, while we do have a lot that uh, we are responsible for as a town council, I want to respect the individual rights of counselors um, to bring forward initiatives that they um, feel are important as the legislative um, individuals responsible for uh, for the town. So um, that's that's my comments right now. Thank you. Okay, Pat. Thank you. I have a personal response to all of this. Uh, the sanctuary bylaw was brought to the select board and town meeting by a group of us who were trying to prevent the possibility of people being deported. Uh, at the time, Lucio was not, uh, we weren't trying to protect Lucio per se. We were trying to protect a group of people who were being uh, treated uh, inhumanely in many respects. Um, I joined town meeting to help pass that sanctuary bylaw, and all of us who were involved in the Amherst Sanctuary were floored when we had nearly 100% vote and support. There were only three dissenters in the entire town meeting. One of those dissenters ran in District 2 for the original council. That's why I'm on the council because I couldn't have a person like that sit on the council. I also, at the age of 17, had an illegal abortion. And I bring it up because I had no protection. Um, the doctor I went to who confirmed that I was pregnant, um, when I came back, no longer pregnant because I had had an illegal abortion, um, a basically a self-induced abortion. Um, that doctor told me, oh, I wasn't pregnant. And I was pregnant. I was quite pregnant. Luckily, early enough. Um, and I bring that up because I'm not different from a lot of people who will now have to revert to illegal abortions, illegal health care, trans people, people born into the wrong body who feel they need a real change, risking their lives to become the person that they want to become. So God damn it, I don't care about your process. 
I don't care about your reservations. This is needed if it saves one person in Amherst, protects one person. That's it. Thank you. Pam? Mandy, Jerry, did you have a comment? I have a response to Michelle's question. Okay. Um, go ahead. So the state law, as I read it, um, declares the act of filing that lawsuit in Texas or whatever, um, a interference with the exercise and enjoyment of the rights secured by the constitution and laws of the Commonwealth and a violation of public policy of the Commonwealth. It doesn't stop the lawsuit from proceeding. It just declares it a violation of your rights in Massachusetts. And the next clause then says, you can then sue them for violating your rights in Massachusetts. Um, so, so the state law doesn't really talk about the distribution and the, the, all the requests for information and stuff that come with filing lawsuits or criminal complaints in other jurisdictions. It just says, well, if that happens to you, well, you can file a lawsuit in Massachusetts. <laughs> How I read it. Now, I could be missing some stuff because the session laws are really hard to sometimes read, but that's how I read the law that was passed. Michelle, did you have any follow-up on that? No, thank you. Okay. Pam? So that sort of answers my question, and that is, you know, how might this bylaw prevent uh, a lawsuit against somebody in Massachusetts? And I guess it does not, um, but it just simply says, as I understand it, that no additional information would be provided with the help of town employees. It doesn't say anything about non-town employees, um, but it's simply being assisted by anyone in the town employee. So I um, want to, I was on the periphery of the immigration protection, but actually Pat and I uh, met with the pastor at the church and um, it was about the time some permissions were expiring and it was important that we get an extension. And one of the things that was so critical was that it was consistent with how our police had acted. It was also consistent with the um, refuge that a church provides. So I'm looking at this and I just wanna make sure I understand. It means that if somebody um, came forward with a lawsuit that our, our subpoena or whatever, our police would not deliver it, okay? And the second thing is that if they wanted to look at our videotapes, our police would not deliver that. Is that what we're saying? Or our IT or other Or IT or anybody else. Or, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate your taking the time to unwrap the law for me and, and what this does and what it says to our town employees. Are there any other questions? A motion's been made and second. It's a referral of this bylaw to GOL to then be returned to the council after substantive review and review of clarity, consistency, and actionability by uh, July 17th, 2023. Is there no, seeing no other questions, we're gonna move to the vote. It was seconded, yeah. Uh, we're going to start with Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane's absent. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Belmel. Yes. Pat Angelus. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. And Reese Merzen. Aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. It passed unanimously with one absent. Um, the next item on our agenda was approved on the consent agenda. Um, unless somebody would absolutely like another break, I'm gonna continue on. Okay, all right. Um, we do have 
uh, the appointments for the Amherst Housing Authority Board of Commissioners was um, approved. We're going on to liaison reports. Mandy Joe, CRC. Uh, I wrote an actual report that's in your packet. Sorry, it was late, but nothing was really on the agenda for tonight, but um, any questions I can answer. Michelle, do you have a question about CRC? I do, and I'm just, I was reading um, the report that um, Mandy just referred to. Um, I'm sorry, just give me one second. I didn't think it was going to be <laughs> so fast. Um, okay, here we are. Um, so this is about the sufficiency of the applicant pool um, for the ZBA. Um, it's, it states in the report that the ZBA, uh, it was in, in insufficient. Um, and it also states that it's extremely important for us to obtain a sufficient pool in the next two weeks, um, given the vacancies. Um, so I was just wondering, I was looking at our council policy um, on uh, sufficiency of the pool. And one of the criteria in there is um, that it says, you know, that one one criteria is that the current needs of the body to be appointed, including any current burdens placed on the body by a vacancy is a reason um, for considering a, a pool sufficient. Um, and I'm just wondering if that, what sort of weight you might see that carrying, um, and if you could just provide any, given the urgency, if you could provide any input on that and whether this is a policy that could be amended um, given the circumstances or if it's um, really directly to the charter and needs to just be um, uh, needs us to, uh, you know, what's the word that I'm looking for? Anyway, I think you get the gist. <laughs> I won't go on. No. Um, yeah, so so basically, in about two weeks, that's the latest or so CRC can wait to declare the pool sufficient and still complete the process, or hopefully complete the process, um, by the June 27th last council meeting before July 1, um, when the council would vote, um, because the terms expire June 30. Um, in the last four years, the council has dealt with this in various different ways, and, and CRC and GOL have dealt with sufficiency of applicant pools in different ways. Um, CRC definitely has had conversations about what do we do if we just don't have the numbers we're looking for? Um, and we will continue to have those conversations. And as the deadline gets closer, the determination of sufficiency may change um, <laughs> because of where the deadlines fall. Um, but uh, given where we are now um, and where the timing was at the last CRC meeting, CRC did not feel confident declaring the pool sufficient based on the criteria and the numbers we have. And if people are wondering, we have four applicants for six spots. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> that's where we stand right now. Jennifer? Well, thank, thank you. I'm sorry, if I could just follow up to say, if there's any information that, if you've already sent it, I apologize, um, but where we could share with folks to try to get some people to apply, um, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Let's send that email out again, okay? Uh, Jennifer, was that your hand up? Yeah, I took it down. I was just gonna say, Athena sent out information after the last council meeting, so maybe, but no, I was really just gonna say, just get the word out. I, right, you can hear, yeah. I you, nab, no, I, I nabbed someone at Cup of Joe. Because <laughs> he said he was an engineer. I said, I sent him the... <laughs> Yes, she did. I was sitting I mean, you might on the other side. Local grocery store. Right. Um, so uh, we'll resend, make sure that all counselors are resent the information about these positions that are open uh, and any other ones. Um, Alicia, Kathy is not here and Paul. So I'm gonna ask if either you or Paul have anything to say about the elementary school building committee besides the fact that it's fabulous that we're celebrating this. Alicia? Um, yeah, we haven't had another meeting since the last council meeting, but we have uh, broken into subcommittees. So we have a subcommittee looking at 
um, specifics for the interior of the building. And then we have another um, subcommittee that is looking at um, the playground and the outdoor space at the school right now. Um, and they each have had one meeting and they'll be meeting weekly. Um, and I don't think the elementary school building will have another meeting until June. So we're sort of just working on the details right now. There will be more public forums and, and we encourage people to come to the subcommittee meetings if they have any input for either interior or exterior design. Okay. Paul, did you have anything you want to add? No, that was perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Alicia. Um, Finance Committee, Andy. Yes, I think that the only thing to do is to just quickly go over the dates of the remaining part of our process. Just to, it's a reminder, <laughs> tomorrow at 5.30 p.m., uh, we're having another one of the budget review uh, meetings where we're going to be talking about part from the public works in the enterprise funds on the 19th which is friday at one o'clock we'll be talking about general government and uh conservation uh planning inspections or conservation and development however you want to call it um then we're nearing the end. Uh, that was to be the end, but two departments were postponed till the 23rd, which was going to be our first discussion meeting. So those are public health and fire EMS. And we will begin the meeting with those. And uh, Lynn and I haven't had a chance to talk about it, but I assume that the first part of the meeting will still be posted as a council meeting so that uh, we continue the practice of counselors being able to ask questions of all um, department heads as they come forward. At that point um, in the meeting, when that's completed, we'll start shifting to what's the work of the committee itself, which is to then take all of the information that we've obtained, including tonight's hearing, and uh, finalize our recommendations and try and move it to a report uh, with meetings uh, also on the 26th and 30th um, and uh, try and see that we can uh, complete the work by June 1st, which is the um, 30 days it's allotted by the charter. Um, so we have postponed all other things that were um, we were asked to look at. We do have a list of things. Dorothy Pam brought up one that we have not forgotten about, which is the uh, whole subject of counselor compensation. Uh, uh, John Mangano provided us with uh, an analysis of the costs of the various components that were recommended. Uh, and uh, we will get a uh, recommendation back to uh, the council cognizant of the uh, need to do so, so that there can be action uh, prior to the uh, deadline that's established in the charter, which is uh, it's very beginning of July. So. Uh, um, those are our highest priorities um, right now is finish the budget and make sure that we uh, get the item that also has a very strict deadline to it. And let me just mention, we already did um, move, make a motion about water and sewer rates, and that will come up back to the council on um, June 5th. Yeah, and there was one other, which was the optional tax exemptions that are provided by state law. And uh, there's an option that's given to local municipalities to extend it and uh, uh, provide a higher level of benefits for those who qualify. That also was voted by the committee. Uh, we did not view those two items um, as being per se, part of the budget uh, the, to the extent that we needed to hold off until we completed the process and had the hearing. So those two things have been voted. 
right? And both of those will come up on June 5th. Um, I just want to also be clear, several, several councils have been regular attendees at the finance committee meetings, and it's led to a really robust conversation. Um, the next two, three meetings, next two will be fully open for the council. The meeting on the 23rd will be open for the two discussions with the Department of Health and um, fire and EMS, and then it reverts to just the finance committee who has to make their recommendation, um, which will come to the council on June 5th. Are there any questions about that? Okay, then GOL, Pat. Uh, yes, thank you. We've been really busy. We've been working on the obstruction of uh, the public way, formerly known as snow and ice removal. We have taken Paul's advice and thought about one enforcement agency we're choosing right now, inspection services. And we realized that there would have to be an education process going on for DPW and police and inspection services so that people actually know where to send the calls, both the community, but the departments themselves. Um, we also um, have been working on flag policy, but this last meeting we looked at the, our policies uh, regarding the control and regulation of public ways, because we looked at banners, the banner that flies. Um, and we've come up with several things about that. One, we want it to be uh, government speech, and um, which means, uh, and we're re giving still the authority in most instances to you, Paul, as the town manager. So uh, you, the United States flag, mass flag, the flags of the universities, things like that, fine. Um, also banners welcoming students and congratulating students or providing uh, seasonal cheer as we decided to define it <laughs> are also something that you will be deciding. It does not have to come to council. Uh, flags and banners, um, advertising events on the town common, again, that would be um, the, but for all other flags and banners, the town council would remain uh, the keeper of the public way is because we felt like given the issues that have come up around flags, we needed to be able to ensure that we could have limits on what was flown across on a banner. So and you'll be getting them. I'll be saying we'd like uh, KP Law to look at that. And then the, we're continuing to work on Rule 6, which is the Code of Conduct in light of the Supreme Judicial Court. What are you saying? Supreme Judicial Court South Barrow decision. Um, and the, the, I think as we're looking to uh, realign some of the sections, but primarily we have to move from one section to road stability and six. Pat, I can't hear you. I, I don't know if, if your button's pressed. Sorry. I forgot the button, Jennifer. Is that what you do? Why didn't you yell? It was Michelle. <laughs> anyway, um, you're there so you know what's going on, Michelle. So anyway, thank you. And we meet again on uh, May 24th and then June 7th at 930. Okay. Um, Anika, Jones Library Building. Okay, so the Jones Library Building Committee is still has not met since our last meeting. The meeting scheduled for Thursday, June 1st <clears throat> at 4.30 has been canceled. So the next meeting will be June 8th at 11 a.m. at the Woodbury Room, and that will be to review exterior brick samples um, with architects on site. And then followed by June 15th at 4.30 to review uh, the reconciled cost estimate, and then on June 22nd to review the updated landscaping plan. Um, TSO, Anika? Oh, I'm sorry, there, is there a question? Okay, Anika, TSO. So TSO, the report is in the packet, I think fairly detailed. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, aside from the regular TSO business, we also wished Councilor Steinberg a happy birthday. So I'm wishing him a belated happy birthday. <laughs> Did he skip the meeting? 
<laughs> we forced we forced him to. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, are there any questions for TSO? Okay, liaison reports. Any uh, reports to share? Jennifer, you have your hand up, I think. Use your mic, please. Yeah, you're right. The, the <laughs> affordable housing trusts. God, I can't remember that. Um, so they um are going to be having a listening session at the bank center. It's in person on Tuesday, June twentieth, from six thirty to eight thirty p.m. And this is um ooh, let me get my notes here. It is a joint session um between the Affordable Housing Trust, the Human Rights Commission the Board of Health and the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee. And um, they're, you know, being very, you know, proactive in trying to get the word out to as many residents as possible. And it sounds like a really be great if counselors could be there, really um, terrific evening. They'll have different tables and different groups. And again, it's really just a listening session. So all those, you know, different um, entities, you know, committees and commissions can, you know, really hear from residents about what they need in the area of affordable housing. And what's and, the date again? Oh, um, Tuesday, June twentieth, at six thirty p.m., six thirty to eight thirty at the Bank Center. And you might, you'll probably hear it through other channels, but and you know, if you want to share that with your constituents as well. Um, and then this Thursday, May 18th, at 7 o'clock p.m., the Housing Trust will be having a joint meeting with the Community Resources Committee, and we'll be, um, you know, starting to look at where the, uh, you know, what our priorities are in our housing, the gaps in the housing that we have available in Amherst, uh, looking at approaches to reducing the housing gap priority areas. Um, and then determining kind of between CRC and the housing trust of where we could work together and then where we might have our, you know, take on uh, different responsibilities to look at providing more attainable and affordable um, housing opportunities in Amherst. And then I guess the last would be um, the housing trust is really busy, but they, the Belcher Town Road project, um, Paul can correct me if I, if I get this not quite correct, but that they have, uh, the two sites have been combined by the town and that where it looks like they are now is the um, architectural design continues to be developed and that they are wrapping up the schematic design phase and will be moving into the design development phase. So that project is, is moving along as is the East Street School. I don't have as many details on that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, they're really interesting meetings. <laughs> One Thursday a month at uh, 7 p.m. Okay, okay, that's that's it, thanks. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. I was just going to report on the planning board. The planning board has taken the duplex, I'll call it the duplex, triplex, uh, converted dwelling, et cetera, um, zoning. And they are they are discussing in depth um, sort of each of the categories. So it, there have been some really uh, good in-depth conversations about what what that means, what what might be unintended consequences. And uh, so the next meeting um, will be focused on the triplex, the three family units. Jennifer, you have your hand up. Yeah, there was another thing I forgot to add about um, the housing trust, which you might be interested in, is they invited representatives from University of Massachusetts came to their last meeting to discuss the student housing situation. I wanted to add that. Okay, thank you. Are there any other uh, liaison reports? Seeing none, uh, we've approved the minutes. Paul, uh, this is one of the weeks without a written report. Any particular comments you want to make? I do. I have several. Um, first, to recognize that last Thursday, May 11th, was the end of the pandemic state of emergency. So you'll notice that the limited capacity for our rooms are removed. Um, and that's really the biggest significant um, uh, change for the town building. So our, we're back to regular capacity. I think people are going to be self-regulating. And again, we are a mask welcoming community. If people prefer to wear masks, we still have them available and people can choose to wear them if they choose. Um, coming up in the next two weekends will be graduations. This weekend, uh, May 20th is Hampshire College's graduation. 
Then the next weekend will uh, May 20, the weekend of May 27th will be UMass and Amherst College, um, both graduations on the same weekend. Again, that same weekend will be the Memorial Day um, uh, commemoration on Monday. I think it starts at 930. And typically what we do there is that we gather uh, in the Spring Street parking lot and then we march. This is a, a, a memorial event. It's not a celebratory event. It's to commemorate people uh, who served in the military who have passed away. And so we march up Spring Street to uh, South Pleasant Street, down North Pleasant Street, turn up Triangle Street, and wind up at the uh, at the memorial at the um, at the veteran memorial near the swimming pool. Uh, and then there's usually a few people who will speak there. So you're all welcome to join in the in the march in the parade, um, or or you can join us at the um, event itself. Um, in anticipation of all these events, there um, the next few days will be um, a lot of paving going on on Northampton Road. They will be doing um, the intersection at South Pleasant Street and Amherst and uh, Northampton Road and College Street which is a major uh, paving project, and also at uh, Northampton Road and University Drive. These projects will be done at beginning at 2 a.m. so that they can be wrapped up and out of there by 7 a.m. to try to avoid the, um, uh, the biggest times of heavy traffic. They also require detours uh, to side streets so they can be more efficient. They will also be doing the section in between um, that between the two intersections down Northampton Road. So this is, it'll all be happening this week. A lot of it is weather dependent. Uh, it's gonna be a little bit colder this week. So we're hoping that they'll still be able to meet their schedule. Um, if, at last um, Saturday night, uh, there was a sewer break. And this is just one because I happened to be watching them a lot and it was helpful this happens this is our crew right they're they're out there on saturday night um trying to repair a sewer main break uh, with a lot of rental houses and, and um, housing authority uh, so that they could continue to use their facilities uh, we had crews there overnight to keep pumping the sewage through the system and then Sunday morning at 7 a.m., Mother's Day, we had a crew of DPW employees come in to um, do a temporary repair so they, until they could get back and do a permanent repair. So just credit to our highway water, water and wastewater divisions who were all on site helping out. You know, you know, one guy spent the night, but then he said he had a new baby at home and his his first baby, and he said, "I cannot, I cannot miss my wife's first Mother's Day." So he left at 7 a.m. to be home. So. Um, but just to, they, it's amazing how they step up. It's complex. One, every one of these projects is difficult. Um, they, you know, you're dealing in this situation. They're dealing with the clay pipe that had collapsed. Uh, they tried to do, in, you know, immediate repairs, but it's clearly it needed to be replaced. So, um, you know, Guilford Mooring was on scene as they were trying to scope out what the problem was. They put a camera through it to see it as far as they could. Um, so it's just, you know, I just admired the work that they did and they come in on Saturday night and Sunday to be here and just appreciated that. Um, the, um, we have a couple big projects that we're starting to get ready to launch that you have approved. One is the construction of the Centennial Treatment Plant. So that's a really big project. It will impact the town of Pelham because it's located in the town of Pelham. We're working with the town um, to make sure to, to stage the work. Um, and so that's a major construction project. And then also the gravity belt thickener at the wastewater treatment plant, another one that you love to uh, talk about. So um, <laughs> just don't think about, I think, um, it's good projects moving forward. Um, so along all those, we were also experiencing a lot of staff um, turnover and we have vacancies. So for instance, as we have pressure on our DPW, they are down five people and we continue to try to recruit. It's hard to find people um, that um, will be able to work in art and have the skill sets that we need. So, you know, there a lot of people are covering for each other. And it was really readily apparent during the water main, during the sewer main break, that they were all sort of really sort of working overtime. They literally were working overtime. So, and then also um, just to recognize our HR staffing, as you may know, we lost two of our three employees in that department. So, 
Um, our HR director is still there, and she's she. You know, we we're, uh, have some additional su support for her, but you lose two people out of your office. There, there's there. We're just trying to keep the um, things moving through because it's a, it's a very busy time for hiring and that type of thing. So credit to Melissa for for uh, powering through. And the last thing is just wanted to note that um, it sounds like the Boston Globe is going to be doing a story on First Amendment audits. If you remember what those are, that's where people come into the town hall typically, and they've been here, um, and they take uh, videos of, of people and and sometimes can be provocative. Apparently, there was an incident at the Lexington Public Library that was very controversial. They were at the um, Arlington Town Hall um, with our former finance director, Sandy Pooler, as the uh, town manager who was featured um, in their in their show. So, um, but the, the Globe decided that they're looking to do a story on it. And since we had I did a memo back in 2019 on this, which has been uh, shared pretty widely throughout the state. And that's sort of, a, we did a webinar on it uh, like last year, I think, or earlier this year. And um, and so they were really eager to hear our perspective and how we got started on it. So hope that's likely to be an article in the Globe at some point. Um, and that's my report. Any questions if anybody has? Are there questions of the town manager? Pat? I don't have a question. I would like you to send from the council. I am speaking for the council right now <laughs> to thank the workers, the DPW workers who put in that time and that effort for this community. I would be pleased to do that. Thank you. Do thank need, you, Pat. Do we need to vote on that? <laughs> um, are there any other questions or comments to the town manager? Anna? Uh, Paul, could you provide a quick update on where we're at with community choice aggregation? Please. Has anything moved since the last update? Yes. Um, something moved tonight, actually, and I haven't really looked at it's it. It's like I knew. You, I'm just right. kidding. <laughs> Did you? No, I'm just curious. <laughs> because I, I, have a, I have a sixth sense about community choice aggregation. It's my one hidden, um, hidden psychic ability. So we're trying to schedule... We're trying to schedule a, a something, and I just saw that they're, they're trying to schedule something. With Stephanie Ciccarello, here we go. Um, in early June for a community session uh, be, be held jointly with Northampton, Pelham, uh, and Amherst. And we'll have a, some introductory remarks, a, a presentation, but they're still trying to get the, nailed down the date that everybody can be there. So Thank that's you. early June. Thank you. Um, town Councilor comments. I have a written report that will come with the next meeting. Uh, I'm going to be checking in with a couple different committees, including AHRA, as to when you will be ready to come forward to for the council. Um, and um, we continue to shuffle the future agenda items. Are there any Councilor comments at this time? Okay, it's 8.43 and we're adjourned. <laughs>